All right, in today's episode, we have Brett Contreras on the show. He's one of the world's most well-known trainers and coaches. He's a PhD, but he also have lo- he also has lots of experience training lots of different people, and he's best known for developing some of the best butts in the business. He's trained champion athletes and stage competitors, and again, he's well known for developing amazing butts, round, firm, strong butts. In fact, the hip thrust was largely popularized by Brett Contreras. In fact, he'll say himself he invented the exercise. Not sure if I agree with him. I I think maybe that's true, but I do know that nobody was doing them until he started talking about them. He's also a PhD, so he's a science guy. It's a great episode. In today's episode, we talk all about building the butt. We talk about his business. We talk about building muscle, the science behind it, the science behind recovery, workout programming. You're going to love this episode. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We also have a sale going on right now. Maps Symmetry, half off. And the RGB Bundle, half off. If you're interested in either one, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show with Brett Contreras. Check it out. You know what? Let's actually open with that, Brett, because that's interesting to me. I did not know that. So off air, Adam asked you if you grandfather in pr- your your old clients with their old pricing or if you raise their pricing as you continue to grow in popularity. And you said something shocking to me. You don't charge anybody anything when they train with you? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> no money. How does this work? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I've charged anyone for about eight years. Um, it started in Phoenix. But uh, when I went to San Diego, I remember... I was waiting for my business license and I'm like, God, this is taking forever. And people were like, can I come train with you? And I'm like, you can train with me as a training partner, not a client, right? Like <laughs> you're just a lifting partner. Cause I, I didn't, and I'm like, it's, it's not business. <laughs> like, cause I don't have a business range. license. Well, I probably still could have gotten sued. I don't, <laughs> but I, I was just like, oh, I'm just going to get started. It's taking forever. Um, so I started training Masa. She's my, she's Persian. She's like high level bikini competitor. But everyone in San Diego wanted to be like Masa. So they all followed her. So, so I'm training like 30 bikini competitors. And um, I don't know, when I got my business license, I'm like, I don't want to lose any of them. Even if I charge like 20 a session, 30, like say, cause I train groups. I'd have 20 girls in there at once. I'm like, I want them to come more frequently. The more they come, the better results they see. If I charge them money, they can't come as much. Plus, back then, it's before the algorithms, you know, like back in the good old days, yeah. when stories, you know, I'd, I'd get so many views, they'd all be, <clears throat> I'm not, okay. If I show up wearing jorts, you know, I could wear flip flops. I could be 10 minutes late. I can be ranting about my day. I can be favoring one client. They all love me though. Cause I don't charge them. Right. I'm everyone's favorite. They love me. My, my, my clients adore me yeah. and you see it. They're always like, love my coach. But if I charge them, I better show up on time. I better be wearing like a, you know, a colored shirt. I better have a clipboard. I better count reps. I better, be professional. I better not talk about myself or my day. It's all about them. And I got to be, I hate training one-on-one. I can't do it anymore. I hate the small the honest trainer. I hate yeah. like the, so how was your weekend? I just, I, I load it full of people. I blare the music and it's, it's the biggest rush. Like on my birthday, all my clients surprised me. They all wore jorts. <laughs> that's great. Jorts and a tank top. Oh, that's great. And they looked like me. And they all showed up. And I so I had everyone there. And it was the best day for me. Cause I can be like, it's such a challenge and I can pull it off. Like one-on-one is so boring. It's if I got 20 high-level people in there and they're all like, what do I do next? And I'm like, I, I get to really, you know, but then I, but then after like three, four hours, I'm dead. I can't train for I train people six days a week. I'm in the gym. And I think I'm the only evidence-based person, by the way, that's still in the gym. <laughs> they all they all talked. You, you mentioned yeah. before this, we found a way to do our dream jobs. They all couldn't wait to make a lot of money so they could get out of the gym. I couldn't wait to make a lot of money so I could be in the gym yeah, all day great. long. And that's where I, 
I remember watching uh, Louis Simmons documentary and I could relate to it so much. The passion. And, yeah. That's what I just love doing. And, Do you, but I, I don't charge people for a couple of reasons. Number one, because then they, yeah, they don't have expectations of me. They're just happy. They're all, they all love me. But number two, it's giving back. I used to be a high school math teacher in Scottsdale school district. I made my starting salary back in like, I think it was like 2000 or something when I started, but it was like $29,600. And then my sixth year with a master's degree, I was making like 34,000. So back then my friends at the time were like realtors and stuff, killing it. Cause before the housing market crash and they'd be like, Brett, let's go out this weekend. And I'm like, where are we going? Oh, let's go to the W. Ugh, they charge cover there. It's an expensive night guys. I, I got to stay in. No, no, no. We got you. And I'm like, I feel like, uh, it doesn't feel very manly having my guy friends carry me, but they're like, Brett, if you come, you're going to attract women. You're going to have, you're, <laughs> you're always the life of the party. I used to drink a lot and get crazy. <laughs> now I don't drink. But anyway, I looked at it like a side job. I'm like, okay, I like this. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and like be the most social person and be so much fun. And then they'll pay for me. But it was so cool getting, having my friends take care of me. I liked free stuff. It helped. You know, if someone, if you got 20 bucks back then, I'm like, oh my God, that pays for like Netflix and something like I had to care about that stuff back then. So now I live in expensive cities, you know, San Diego, Fort Lauderdale, these are expensive places to live. So if I can help them out a little bit, then they can use that for whatever they can, they can use that few hundred bucks. They save a month on something else. And the third thing, I just feel like then they're, yeah, they, they, so in San Diego, this strategy I didn't do it for this purpose, but all of a sudden everyone was tagging me. Like I love my coach, best coach ever. And it was like social proof. So I was thinking about, it, I'm like, everyone's, you know, companies pay to sponsor people. I'm not sponsored. They're all like, they tag me more than they tag their sponsors yeah. and I'm not paying them anything. I'm just training them for free. So I had all these trainers that my whole life have been, you need to respect yourself. You need to, <laughs> And I'm like, like in the beginning when I sold my ebook for 30 bucks and they're like, you should be charging way more for that. Or why are you giving away all your information for free? No one's going to want to see you speak and everything. I was like, I don't think they're giving me good advice. I think they're threatened. <laughs> hundred percent. Yep. I mean, this yeah. is the, the law of reciprocity, right? So you've hacked, whether you knew you were doing that or not, you hacked into that by leading from that place of wanting to help and to give. The, the natural feeling that these people get is they, they want to give back, especially I, yeah, when you yeah. change their lives or, you know, you they, blow they their mind. They've been, they've been working they at building this physique for a year, decades, and then you come in and you teach them some things and completely change them. I mean, those people are so loyal. That person goes and tells eight, 10 people about you and you start building that I, up. I think it's an inherent thing that good trainers have a couple of inherent things. First of all, you, you always have a good instinct of what to like if I trained you, I'd be like, and I'm giving you the pendulum squat or something. I know I'm going to throw on, I bet you can do three plates or something. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know what to start someone out at. People always said that about me, but I also just care so much about the results. My sister always jokes that you could stab me in the, in the, in the belly. And as I'm bleeding out, you, you, I'd be mad at you with, you'd be like, Brett, I PR did it. And I'd be like, good job. <laughs> <laughs> High five on my way out. But I do, I care about people's fitness more than they do. Yeah, I, I want to. So you're you definitely the trainer that is passionate that's doing this because they care about people, and most trainers are this way. I do have to say though, for most trainers, because we got to get into the details, the advice you're giving to train people for free, to not try to essentially build your business in that way, is terrible advice. However, you have turned this into an extremely successful business. You're not not making money, so it's not like you're living in a you know, uh, on the streets and training people for free and showing up or whatever you figured out how to turn this into a business. How did you do that? How do you earn a living being able to do what you do when you're not charging people even today, you said. So, yeah. Um, it's funny when, when, when I first started in the industry, I decided, well, I actually didn't Martin Rooney, you know, Martin Rooney, he mm. came up with a name. I was at a perform better, uh, conference and I was talking to Martin Rooney and he's like, you should call yourself the glute guy. I've never known anyone so into the glutes. And I'm like, hmm. 
yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to call myself the glute guy. And at that same conference, there was this guy, he's like their financial guru, their business advisor. And we were at this social event and he's kind of like drumming up business for himself. He's going around patting people on the back and trying to, and he's like, son, what's your, what's your passion? And I said, glutes. And he started laughing. He goes, that's a hobby. You won't, you'll never make a career out of that. Oh, wow. And I remember <laughs> just right, you know, I was, this was 2009 and I'm like, no, nah, he doesn't get, he doesn't understand how big the glutes are, or how big I'm going to get them because I've got all these new methods I'm going to show people. But I was the only glute guy for like 10 years. And then now there's so many oh, yeah. glute, glute people, glute, you name it, there's glute doc, glute, <laughs> yeah, yeah. glute poppy, the, everything you can think of, you know, I, uh, but here was the turning point for me. And it's, it's funny because I always credit my friend Carrie and people are like, I told you that before her, but it doesn't matter. She got through to me. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a few people. But yeah, Carrie was over at my house and my, my client, Carrie Northington, she's a bikini competitor and a nurse. And she's like, Brett, you're the world's glute expert and you don't have a flagship glute program. I go, yeah, I do. I got strong by Brett. And she's like, that sounds like powerlifting. I don't want to do strong by Brett. I want glutes by Brett. And I go, well, I trademarked booty by Brett. I just never did anything with it. She goes, call it by booty by Brett and actually promote it. You're doing all this work that requires more work out of you. That doesn't require that scales. Like you, you don't, you don't have to do any more work. Smart. And so I went, Hmm, she's right. I probably had like <clears throat> say two, 3000 uh, members. I changed it to booty by Brett and made a, an ad I think I have that ad pinned, <laughs> but anyway, it went to like 6,000 overnight. Then I promoted it. And I think it's at around 12,000 members right now. Wow. 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 Paying 30 bucks a month. So that's exceptional. Yeah. And so for so obviously that, that one revenue streams, like, uh, probably like, I don't know, th three to 4 million. I get most of that. That's the easy business because, um, the, the, you know, I have, People, I have a, a Facebook, private Facebook group, and I have three moderators, and I have people help out with the videos, but I get almost all that. Now, BC Strength is my other main business. Real products are a pain in the butt. <laughs> you know, that's like the, <laughs> the, that, that's, I do BC Strength because I love, well, I also think, at what age does glute guy become creepy? Like, I'm, 40, <laughs> I'm 47. Good foresight I don't know there. Good foresight there. Close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 47, close. I try to stay fit, but like 55? I don't know. I'm not going to be a six-year-old glute we'll guy. We'll do a poll. We'll do a poll. Yeah. <laughs> six-year-old glute ride guy. I'll that all the way you. into the sunset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, you so, know I'm an expert on butts. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. I've got an expiration date on me. So I think uh, BC strength, and I love equipment. And I feel like you guys can probably relate. You guys could probably go to every machine in the gym and be like, this could be better. Oh, yes. They should, they should right. have done this differently. Yeah. Yes. And I get to do that. And I get to make equipment that fits women too. These poor five footers, they're screwed with every piece of equipment. So I try to make mine. But anyway, with, with the real business, you have so many of shipping problems. You have, yeah. you know, when the price of steel goes up or there's the, that, that shipping disaster earlier in the year, that port, whatever, that that boat got stuck, mm -hmm. that get you, know, you get delays. And then, People type in their address wrong all the time and then they blame you and they will not accept like we don't touch that. That's you. You typed in and you confirmed it and then they get mad and give you like a bad review. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like crazy people. And then, you know, FedEx, UPS, you'll order something. It comes in two boxes. You get one one day, you get one four days later. And it's like, why did why were the, you get shipped them at the same time? But people get mad and I can relate. I get annoyed, too. So. But with that business, I try to have really good customer service. Like, because back when I first started ordering equipment, <clears throat> I ordered equipment in 2003, I remember. I spent like 15, 20 grand, and it took nine months to get to me. Jeez. Nine months. Wow. And I was so annoyed. And, and then Rogue came out, and they started, you'd order something, you'd get it the next week. Now with Amazon, Sometimes you get it the next day. Like, so I try to, when you order something from BC strength, it ships out the very next day. So I have to have it in stock. So I always, you have to, it's like, a, I don't just, yeah, you have to have a warehouse and have it in stock always. But I, I try to do a really good job with that. But anyway, there I split the profit so many ways. I probably with B, with booty by bread, I probably get 80% of it with BC strength. I probably get 
25 percent of it maybe right. but employee shipping overhead all like, that stuff yeah. yeah but it sounds like a lot of fun especially if you're into biomechanics and training yeah one thing that we, we've always liked about you brett um is you're a real trainer there's a lot of fitness influencers out there that are not real trainers and you can tell by the way they answer questions you know uh you you tend to answer questions like good trainers tend to do which is it depends and who am i talking about and sometimes this is yes. better and sometimes that is better. or phds that have done nothing but live in a lab yes uh, you yes know what I'm saying like that they'll just, just point they read to the st studies all yeah. day long but they haven't Where's gone your and evidence yeah. and that's that's actually <laughs> the point that i'm gonna and that's the point that i'm gonna go to is because you also have a lot of integrity um at least when it, in regards to training and in fitness and you actually displayed that very well recently with the study that came out that compared the squat and the hip thrust. And before that, you'd always made the case that the hip thrust was superior in, in, in many different ways. Then the study comes out that shows that they're both very effective at developing the glutes. And you came out and did a post and talked about it and with, with tremendous integrity. First off, let's talk about the study. Let's talk about your position before. Let's talk about the study. And let's talk about if you change your position or if it confirmed your position or maybe if there's some nuance that we should discuss. Yep. Okay, so this is the Plotkin study you're describing. I'm going to pull it up just so I have the title of it uh, so people can Google it. So the title of the study is Hip Thrust and Back Squat Training Elicit Similar Gluteus Muscle Hypertrophy and Transfer to the Deadlift. Yeah. Just waiting for the load. No <laughs> um, you can Google that. It's a preprint. It's not published yet, but it will be published in time. Um so the reason this study came to be is um, a fake study emerged in 2020 by Barbalo and Gentile. And it's funny because I remember having a, I've never once read a study and been like, this is fake. But this was like a year prior in 2019, I was doing a seminar with my <coughs> trainers on a volume study. Remember these studies were emerging showing like, five and 10 sets saw better results than 15 and 20 sets. And it didn't match the rest of the research because mm -hmm. it was fake, <laughs> but I'm looking at it and every single graph was like linear, like perfect. And Brad and I, I've st published so many studies with Brad and you know, he'll send me the data and we try to make sense of it. Like the mind muscle connection one. We're like, why did it work for the biceps, but not the quads? And then we have to, try to explain that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you try to come up with a reason, but the data never comes out neat. And I went, I had this light bulb moment. I went, oh my God, this study's fake. And then I looked at, I'm like, all this stuff's, I think this group's fake. The research is fake. So I called James Krieger. I called Andrew Vygotsky. I called Brad Schoenfeld. And I'm like, I think all this, this, this look, it's too clean. It's too neat. And then back then they didn't care enough. They're just like, I don't know how you'd prove it. Like, how would you, you know, I don't, we don't know of any methods to show that it's fake. Well, then like one year later, I remember I was at the LA Fit Expo greeting everyone. It had to be in this good mood. And then all of a sudden I keep getting these emails and text messages and DMs and stuff. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? And it was like this study showing that squats greatly outperform hip thrusts. And I look at the authors and it's Barbalo and Gentile. Yeah. And I'm like, it's, I just knew right away it's fake. But then that I put on a fake smile the rest of the day, went home that night and I read it and I'm like, this doesn't add up. If you're a real trainer, you know that you get a group of girls training with you. They'll, for like say 10 weeks, they'll put on 100, 150 pounds on their hip thrust. They'll only put on 30 pounds maybe or 20 pounds on their yeah. squat, you know? Yeah. It's just the way it works. So none of it added up from a like a practical perspective. So I wrote this piece crit critiquing it, thinking everyone was going to be like, hooray, Brett, he proved that this study was fake. And oh God, it backfired on me. <laughs> it's the first time I, I learned like, yeah, when you're successful, people kind of hate you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They really hate you. And I went, oh, I had so many memes like Brett refuses to admit the truth. Um, he, and they made like, these buttons like evidence-based or blatant, like, say the author doesn't lift or the, uh, yeah, like blame the, say the author doesn't lift and I'm going for that <laughs> button. And I'm like, how can you be? And a, a lot of the evidence-based people were like, what an amazing study. Oh, I can't, uh, you know, I hate to say I told you guys so. And I'm like, how did you read this study? That's when I realized the evidence-based community is not very, shouldn't you be in the gym to be evidence-based? Shouldn't you be able to 
Like I knew it was, it doesn't even come close. And I, if you read my critique of it. And the only way to know is because you actually train people. I actually train people yeah. every day. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds. So you have like hundreds of examples yeah. going like. So <laughs> like if you actually train people, right, that, that doesn't even work. Also, even from the squat perspective, these people became elite squatters in 10 weeks. Like they'd be like high level power lifters in 10 weeks from a shitty protocol. The protocol was so silly I even did one of the, I embedded the video. I, no one watched it. I embedded a video of my niece doing the protocol. And I said, it's impossible. It was like set of like four sets of 12 to 15 with 30 to 60 seconds rest in between sets. You can't even change the plates within 30 to 60 seconds, <laughs> but you do to failure. You do a set of 15 to failure and rest 30 to 60 seconds. So she's a 200. My niece is, can squat 205. So we, we worked out like what the 15 rep max would be. And then I, I can't change the plates within 60 seconds quick enough, but you go from getting 15 reps to, to stay in that 12 to 15, we had to go down to the bar and then her last set, she only got yeah, yeah. like Just eight attack. reps it's with cardio. the bar yeah. and she couldn't sleep on her stomach for, cause her <laughs> oh quads were so crippled. <laughs> her quads were so sore. So it's a, it's so fake anyway. Yeah. So I'm talking to some of the, evidence-based people, including Menno Hanselmans. And I'm like, Menno, this is fake. Just trust me. And I, I, it was really hurtful that people didn't trust me. Like, when have I been, you know, dishonest? dishonest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we start talking about it where he's like, you know, they used ultrasound too. I go, I don't like ultrasound. I bought for my PhD, I bought a $13,000 ultrasound machine. And I'm like, Ugh. I like like broad jump where it's like you chalk here, you, they jump. You chalk, you see their feet, and then you're like, I'm going to measure that distance. I can't screw this up. <laughs> with ultrasound, it's easier on muscles like the biceps and stuff, but like with the, small. the glutes, well, you see bone and stuff. With glutes, there's no bone underneath. It's a mu another muscle. Depends on where. It's like the glute medius or like one of the obturator, like the deep hip external rotators or whatever. And you see a fascial border. And with like... Just not clear Two enough? Is that why? Girl, I mean, I'm not an ultrasound technician, but I adjusted the gain, the depth, and I'm like, two other girls I saw clear borders, but on my girlfriend at the time and then another client, I'm like, I, I'm not confident with this. And what were they looking at with ultrasound? Hypertrophy, growth? Muscle thickness. Oh, I see. And so they, I don't, it, it was never even done, but they, anyway, men, when men and I talked, we said we should use MRI. We should duplicate this study and use MRI. Well, Three years goes by or whatever, and, you know, out of nowhere, Mike Roberts um, connect, con connects with me. He's a, he's a research professor out of Auburn, and they do they're, – they're doing that stuff on, like, sarcomeric versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. They're doing good stuff. Mm -hmm. So he contacted me about something else, and I'm like, hey, could you guys do a, a glute max, you know, hypertrophy study using MRI? He's like, yeah, we could do it. And I'm like – He's like, I got my student, Daniel Plotkin. I knew of Daniel because Daniel studied under Mike Israel and Brad Schoenfeld. Like he, they were his professors. He's, he's a PhD student who has lifting experience. That's mm -hmm. always a good thing. So Menno just happens to call me up as I just got a quote from them saying it would be 80 grand. And I go, okay, I'll fund it because I'm going to die not knowing the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I told you how much money I make. 80 grand is right. not going to kill me. <laughs> but, but also, by the way, I just want to add this, that again, this is one of the reasons why we like you, is you didn't know what the results were going to be. You thought, you know, you think you know what the results are, but this public, the study could have been published yeah, put in my mouth. and yeah. completely ki crushed you. Oh, it would have yeah. been an embarrassment yeah. if... I kind of am embarrassed by the results, but anyway, we'll get to that. <laughs> which I, which I, okay, yes, let's get there too. So, so, uh, so I, I'm talking to Menno and I'm like, oh God, Menno's going to like balk when he hears how much this is going to cost. He's like, I'll split it with you. I go, well, hold on there. Like, I just got a, a quote. It's going to be 80 grand. He's like, okay. I'm like, you'll, you'll contribute 40 grand. He's like, yeah. You know, what coach does that? Right. Yeah. What person mm -hmm. does that? Like, that's a car, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So he did it. We split it. We we want, we, 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 it would have been nice to have a third group, a combined group, but that's another 40 grand, but they wouldn't have been able to do it. See, students do the research and it's like, you know, you, you got to have universities do this and there's only so much manpower. 
because people always critique studying, like you should have had a group do that. You should have measured the lunge. You should have measured the RDL. Yeah. You should have measured the single leg leg press. You should have had this. You should have had it. Why didn't you have a group that did both? Why didn't you have advanced subjects? And it's just, that's why we need more studies. This is the first of hopefully a long line. But anyway, um, we funded the study. We got the results back. And it's funny because before the study got started, Daniel was trying to, he's like, I don't want to measure EMG. It's not going to be related. I talked to Andrew Vygotsky and Andrew's, Andrew was my intern. He's now like the smartest dude. He's too smart for anyone. He's like this Russian genius. You, I, I still call him and I'm, it's like I need an interpreter. And it's funny because when he was my intern, when he was like 20, it's crazy for you to say that. <laughs> 20, I know 21. And I'm like, you, you like me while you're 21 in one more year, you'll be, so, uh, I can help you at 21. <laughs> And then you're going to be out of my league. And now he laughs at my, like he taught himself statistics. So anyway, these are the guys, Andrew Vygotsky, Brad Schoenfeld, Greg Knuckles, James Krieger. Those are the guys who then did the white paper on the Barbalo stuff, Barbalo and Gentile, and showed that it was fake. this lab, and it, they used the craziest statistical methods. Like they, in, they, they even made up methods that they wanted to publish the methods they used to expose them. And oh, wow. yeah, wonderful. They, they, they spent six months of their lives analyzing the data and basically showing without a shadow of a doubt. And it's funny because then Greg wrote a blog post that was like further explain it. It's like the chance of this happening is like one in 13 million or something. You know what I mean? It just, yeah. they use so many different ways, even like down to like, there's so many more even numbers than odd numbers. Like, no, so there, so the Barbalo stuff didn't, didn't, um, it didn't match up from a practical or from the – you got to fool the – to fake a study, you got to fool the the coaches and trainers and the the scientists and statisticians, and they 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 got too greedy. They were getting away with it. They might have never been caught, but then they messed with the hip thrust. What, you know? what, what, yeah. what was the desired outcome? Why would they publish the fake study? Any idea? Do you know? I don't know. So uh, it's so funny. God, I've never talked about this before. This is like crazy stuff. So Paulo Gentil is a professor in Brazil. And in Brazil, they like how many countries speak Portuguese? Just Brazil and Portugal. So at this point, most of Brazil knows he's a fraud, but he still has a lot of followers and he's so like he will never admit that he faked his research. He'll he doesn't he still like quotes them as if they're real, but I think he just hated hip thrust. He hated single joint movements. He hated, I don't even think of the hip thrust as a single joint movement really, but, but like he hate he, he hates high vol. He, he, all his, all his research would show that like, you know, single joint movements are inferior or like high volume is inferior to low volume. And he was bashing the hip thrust from day one. So he just, I never knew whether a student Barbalo was his student, were they in cahoots together? Um, was Mateus Barbala, was he trying to p please his professor mm. and like fabricate it? But there's no way because they even, even Greg Knuckles and the white paper, they showed that they're publishing way too many studies, way more than any other lab. And like one of the studies involves so many people, it would have been impossible to also, even in that local area to get that many high level squatters that were like now squatting elite numbers. It, it wouldn't happen in this small portion of Brazil where they like, they went crazy on this. They got like, they were like trust at that point, trying to one up each other with like new methods to expose them. So I wrote Barbalo an email and um, it basically, I just said, Hey, we're on to you. And then the, the, the researchers got so mad at me because I wasn't involved in expo. They wouldn't let me, I'm, I'm biased. Like they wouldn't let me in on it. It was like <laughs> Andrew and, and Greg and Brad and James. And I, I had no part in that because they're like, you're biased. Right. The hip would, thrust. That's what people us. would say, right? It needs to be us trying to go after and get retractions. But, uh, I mean, I, I have wrote, speculation. It's, you know, you see this in other fields too with research. Uh, is that researchers and scientists, this is how you get your fame and credibility. If you publish a study that then goes viral, you're known for it. And so, and, and you know, the scientists and researchers are humans too, and humans are oh, flawed. Yeah. And so I think that's the, you think that that's would be the, the motivator? Mo Absolutely. You don't, you don't think it was a potentially direct shot at you? 
Pick I think that was a direct shot at me. Yeah, I think, it's, I think more that one. I think you. But I, it was like, why did they? Why? Why are you faking studies about high volume and about single joint stuff? It's like he's went too far. Gentile sells books and has. Yeah. But it's funny because so so I wrote this email to Barbo like we're on to you. Uh, your your career as a researcher is about to be over, but I'm curious, why did you do it? Was Paulo putting you up to this, or did you do it to serve? I, I'm I'm sure he's going to blame you. But maybe you don't want to fall on the sword. Maybe you want to tell us what happened. And he disappeared. He vanished. And I, the reason why I knew it was because right when I wrote my critique, Barbalo um, disabled his Instagram. And I'm like, guilty people don't do that. Mm. I knew it. Yeah. I'm like, I was calling my friends. He's guilty. He knows. He disabled his Instagram account. Right after, like, Paulo published, like, we just did this study on the hip thrust. It went viral. And like, I made my critique yeah. and right after my critique, he disabled his account. And I'm like, he's guilty. If you're, if you're look at Daniel Plotkin, a real legit study, Daniel Plotkin's going on podcasts talking about it. And yeah. he's, we're transparent. We'll give people the access to the data if they want it. They were, they weren't like that. So Bob Barlow's disappeared. He like vanished. I don't know what, what happened to him, but I want to know what, I want to know the story of, what happened and no one will still a mystery today it's still a mystery and it's so funny because even back when the guys were like the guys were you know um publishing that white paper they're like oh like barbalo's like uncle or grandfather or something or father or something is this um jadar jader j-a-d-e-r barbalo and he's like a He's like, a, you can Google him on Wikipedia comes up. He's been involved in corruption. In the, he's like a Brazilian, like congressman or something <laughs> who's been involved in corruption since the nineties. And they're like, what if something like backfires on us? And I'm like, what? Oh, you're I gonna, see. Like, get killed. You're going to get murdered for exposing us. <laughs> for a hip thrust study. <laughs> he's probably like, you idiot. Why are you fabricating studies? Like, <laughs> and it's so funny That's what fun. people get scared about. But anyway, yeah. yeah, there's this. And then, and then. Now, if, if like, yeah, when this comes out, um, Gentile will just post some, some, something nasty about me. And he says that I'm like a criminal and all this stuff. And then people believe it. It's the stupidest thing. So tell us yeah. about the, so wow. then tell us about the study that you guys did do. So the Plotkin paper. All right. Good. Thank you for getting me you back got on course. track. <laughs> okay. So thank God we did EMG because I was basically saying, Daniel, EMG is going to be related to hypertrophy. He's like, no, it's not. And I'm like, okay, then if it is, you owe me a beer. If it's not, I owe you a beer. So I owe him a beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it was, it didn't, everyone got higher EMG activity with the hip thrust. They also felt it more with the hip thrust. He asked all the subjects, what did you feel more? And every subject said, I feel my glutes working more with hip thrust. Um, so but I'm, they got I'm equal surprised, but I'm surprised and not surprised that you would think that being a trainer because we knew that with EMG studies, we all hated EMG studies because you often feel something more, but it doesn't necessarily produce more results. However, I have a theory as to why you uh, are going that direction. And, 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 and we'll get to that in just a second. But I, I, I think that you have a bit of a self-selection bias because the kind of people that hire you. And these are the kind of people that are going to respond even more so to your training methods. And we'll get to that in just a second, but let's talk about EMG, what it does, why you thought it connected to more to hypertrophy, and then maybe why it didn't necessarily show that. So I wouldn't think EMG. Okay. Like I've always, I, I've always liked the chin up and for years people would say, why would you chin ups wide grip pull downs or, or pull ups or wide grip activate more lat. And I'm like, yeah, but you get a bigger stretch with yeah. the, so it's always like stretch versus but it's funny because with the upper body, I was always the camp of stretch versus activation. But then with the lower body, I've always been like activation over stretch. Mm -hmm. I'm not consistent there. I like sumo stuff. You feel your glutes more when you do sumo. But if you do narrow, you get more yes. range of motion. So um, we need research on that. But basically, in, in this study, since squats and hip thrust tied, squats stretch you a little bit more hip thrust activate you a little bit more. What, what could be the case? It's either two scenarios. Number one is that um, when you tension, there's two types of tension, you know, passive tension and active tension. So the active force comes from, you know, sarcomere 
dynamics. Mm -hmm. The passive force just comes from stretching everything. And so, you know, active force requires activation. And so passive force is higher when you activate it previously because then Titan connects to actin and Titan ends up being a very the stiff segment. And that's probably a big signaler of hypertrophy. So to have like muscles activated and then stretched to a long length is right now, I'd say that's the primary candidate for how muscles grow. But some guys now run with that guys that are in the long length camp, you know, yeah, stupid. like chasm and Mike Isratel would probably be like Titan is everything. I don't think I've heard him talking about that, but chasm I have. And it's funny because those guys are all about long length training and I'm all about short length for glutes, not for everything else, but I I've just seen it. And I would, t I would tell all of them like, I, I all right, I'm going to go off on a quick tangent and then I'll get back to the study results and, and EMG. I've trained like, like Yurishna and Bobby Mono. These are wellness competitors. When I moved to Florida and I'm like, guys, you, you be, you're being told that your legs overpower your glutes. You could get your legs big anytime we got to spend like a whole year growing your glutes and I want to train your glutes three times a week. Quit doing squats, leg press, hack squats, leg extensions, lunges. Let's just do glutes three times a week and I'm going to get you strong. I'm going to have you doing hip thrusts. This machine I have, it's like a bent leg back extension. Yeah. Um, and uh, the gluteator, it's like um, targeted glutes and this multi-hip hammer strength where you do kickbacks and abduction off of it. And I'm just giving, and it's boring. No one wants to, that's why you hire me. Cause I'll make you do the boring shit over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want you, you're, you're, you're hip thrusting three plates for 18 reps. You need to get to 20. Then we're going to go with three plates and a 25. And when you get that for 20, I want you getting four plates for 20 eventually. Right now you're getting it for like six, but that's how you're going to keep growing your glutes. And it within like, two months, their glutes look totally different. Their glutes respond. They, they're growing. So this isn't just some, something theoretical. Like it, I put it to practice and I'm not giving them the long length stuff. And I do think the long length stuff works well. It's just that that fatigues you a lot. You, you take out squats and deadlifts and walking lunges. And now you don't get sore. Really. You can, you can hammer these movements three times a week. Easy. So, um, so I feel like I'm putting that to practice. And if, if those guys said, well, I'll take squats and lunges or RDLs or whatever, single leg leg presses, uh, it's okay. You create a program and I'll create my program. And I wish we could have like a dual off. Like mm -hmm. we vanish for nine, nine, 10 weeks. And then, you know, you do pre-testing and post-testing. Let's see who, let's see who wins in real life, in in the real world. I, I think you're on to the next viral TV show. Yeah, Instead of the biggest yeah. loser, the it's the, yeah, yeah, the biggest booty. You know that's what I wish I could <laughs> Imagine do. Imagine how good that would do. That, that's what I wish I could do because you, <laughs> you have your glutes. theories, you have your studies, but in, in, so I'm still team hip thrust and all that, but I'm biased towards short muscle lengths. But at the end of the day, I am a researcher. I'm a scientist. It's important to know that everyone has biases. I invented the hip thrust, so I'm going to be, so it okay. So back to EMG. why you got the same results. It could be that hip thrusts work through mechanisms that are geared towards activation. For example, maybe something in the Z discs of the sarcomere. When you have the 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 sarcomeres pulling together, there's something in the middle in between those sarcomeres that gets activated, like. This Henning Wackeraj is Brad Schoenfeld's colleague in, in like Holland or something or wherever he lives up in Europe somewhere. And he's really smart about this stuff. And he says that this filament, filament three bag C or bag C filament three, that's a, a, a big candidate. And that would respond to like muscle activation and, and muscle contraction. Whereas another mechanism with Titan Titan would mainly respond to stretch and activate a stretch. Nuclear flattening. When the nucleus flattens out, it gets stretched, and then you get the nucleus that flattens out, and then there's pores in there, and then that can release things. Like it can activate the hippo and the yap-taz pathway. There's all these crazy names. You could spend your life studying this, mm -hmm. the physiology stuff. I'm a more biomechanics guy, but you can't have biomechanics without the physiology of it. But anyway, we don't know crap about it right now we don't, we have so much to learn are there multiple mechanisms um and so i'm leaning towards like 
hip thrusts, growing the glutes through different mechanisms, through like maybe that bag three filament, bag C filament three, whatever it is. And then maybe the maybe squats grow the glutes more through the Titan mechanism, or maybe it is simple and it's mostly just the Titan mechanism, but hip thrusts do put you through enough range of motion because mm -hmm. people act like they just don't work you through a range. It's like they, they get you into about at least like a, like a 90, to, like a parallel squat position, right. you know, but people say, well, it's easy down low, but it's not completely unloaded. So maybe it, maybe it gets you through enough range that it does activate that mechanism sufficiently. And, and what is EMG showing? EMG shows activation mechanisms. Right. So and, and a hip thrust have, beats the squat with yeah, that. Yeah, it has more, uh, probably more motor unit recruitment and more, you know, um, more, more nervous system um, related stuff that activate the muscle. But whereas the squat stretches you more. And uh, so you, that's what EMG can't tell you is how much range of motion you, you go knew that through. though going before i mean i would have yeah, guessed that yeah, even course. without seeing yeah. that i mean it's of course a, it's Brett. closer to an isolation exercise but, it's but, the glutes are directly opposing the way but there's like, always more to the story like people will think oh brett thought emg was going to matter um it doesn't not matter the, the, the reason why is there's something that no one i haven't published this yet i took like 12 of my glute squad girls and i i and the reason i looked at this is was there was this um controversy going around back remember how the seated hip abduction sucks it's the worst exercise it works the piriformis not the yeah. glute max and i'm like guys it works the glute max and we got in this huge argument and basically that i'm glad that arguments died down and you don't have to deal with that every day because my girls are always like what so you're making me do a piriformis exercise i'm like no it works the glute max um but basically when you get to the bottom of a squat and EMG has shown this consistently for a while. You get in the very bottom of the squat, you do feel your glutes a little bit, but act EMG, at least been measured by surface electrodes, only gets to like 10% of max. It's weird, because I feel it when I'm in a mm -hmm. pause squat, but the EMG is not very high. Now, maybe if you did fine wire, you'd get a little bit higher, but e EMG activity does go down. And when you're at the top of a hip thrust, a full lockout, EMG goes up. And so, that's not the same with every muscle like the quads the quads when you're in a deep stretch you get very high quad activity so i was thinking like muscles that activate to a high degree and then you can take it further and look at the length tension relationship and that's this whole thing that you see chris beardsley going on and on about like how if it operates on the descending limb and where you get peak active force and how the passive force if if so with the glute max I was so adamant about this because I use muscle modeling, you know, open sim is what biomechanics use. And with the muscle modeling, it showed that you get peak active force in the glutes right around neutral. So that's where, to me, you're going to get the most signaling, doing exercise that hits you at neutral. And then passive force, like with like the, the semi-tendinosis, here's peak active force and passive force is like triple as high. So it makes sense to stretch that muscle because you get such high mm -hmm. passive forces. But with the glutes max, you didn't get that high of passive forces. So it's like, they're probably not that good of signalers. But then I saw a different model published and I went and looked at that, downloaded that model and it had a whole different curve. This model had active force peaking at 30 degrees of hip flexion, then passive force was very low. And I'm going, why 30 years of hip flexion? What did they change in the model? And Chasm and I actually looked at this together, and Chasm went full, like, geek mode on this. And he found that all they changed was the tendon slack. Hmm. And, like, they didn't measure tendon slack. How do you measure tendon slack with the gluteus maximus, especially because, like, probably 75 to 80% of the fibers attached to fascia. Yeah. So it's like they that wasn't measured. They're modeling. They're trying to make it fit. And so they were making a model that fit deeper hip flexion tasks. And so they just, so what I learned in that experience was that muscle modeling has huge flaws. EMG has huge flaws. Functional anatomy has flaws. Sensation has flaws. The, the, ideally, we'd have training studies on everything because that shows you what really does happen. But the problem is now we've got one training study, but our training study is specific to in beginners 
and the protocol we use, which was twice a week. Yeah. If we use advanced, maybe different results would be seen. If we used higher volumes and frequencies, maybe different results would have been seen. Right. I'm going to make this really simple, okay? Because this made perfect sense to me when I read the study. Look, I've trained clients as well, and I a lot. And I know for a fact that for some people, the hip thrust is a superior butt building exercise. I also know for a lot of people, the barbell squat is as good. And then I would say better because it develops the rest of the body, the rest of the lower body better, which is what the study showed. Now, here's why, here's why you came in with a bit of a bias and why you might've been surprised in my opinion by the results, the kind of people that hire you, what are they interested in? Glutes. Okay. Now, why are they hiring you? Cause they struggle because their quads grow faster. They, their butts not, it's lagging. So you're training people with muscle recruitment patterns that favor mm -hmm. things like quads. Now you do a hip thrust. If, if you want anybody, you know this, if you want anybody, a beginner to feel their butt and they don't feel their butt when they squat, they don't feel their butt when they leg press, they don't feel their butt when they leg, le, uh, do a lunge, you have them do a hip thrust and focus on the squeeze. Yeah. All of a sudden- It's all about the recruitment process. They, that's right. All of a sudden they feel their glutes. You take two different people doing the same exercise You'll see similar recruitment patterns, but they're not going to be identical. This person squatting might use more glute and hamstring. This person might use more quad. This person is going to have more erector spinae, you know, activation. It depends on the individual and the recruitment patterns. And if you're somebody that has trouble getting your butt to grow with conventional barbell squats, deadlifts, and stuff like that, the hip thrust is going to crush for you. If you're the average person and everything works the way, whatever it should, it's 50, 50 shot. then you're, it's, and then you're probably going to be okay. But by the way, you probably should do both. This is the, like the big, mm -hmm. the big thing is mm -hmm. this whole either or is a stupid thing because everybody does both and you should do both. But if I had somebody who had trouble feeling uh, a muscle that you tend to activate with a compound lift, I know as a trainer that I'm going to help them feel that muscle by getting them to squeeze it with say an isolation exercise first. Not pre-fatigue, because there's studies that show that, that that's not what I'm doing. I'm teaching the person to feel it. Then I go do this other compound lift. Now what they've done is they've so very small, and you might not even be able to see this, but most really good trainers can, have changed their technique and form enough to activate and feel the muscle. Because now they know what they're mm -hmm. supposed Just like when you train a person to feel their mid-back, sometimes what do you do? You put your finger on their mid-back, you give them that outside feedback. Oh, there it is. Now I can feel it. That's why you see better results with hip thrust because the people that hire you have been struggling to develop their glutes. I bet you that the, the subjects in the study were just people, just regular people. And that's what you're going to get across the board. I bet you if they took a sample size of 50 people who have been working out for a while, who are like, my butt doesn't respond. And then they did that study. I bet you hip thrust would win. So yeah, to, definitely, definitely a theory. And I think there's merit to the people who find me are the people who, and not just that they respond best to glutes. They, they're going to push themselves harder on when they feel their glutes. They're totally. not going to want to push themselves as hard on squats if they feel it on their quads and deadlifts if they feel it in their low back or something like that. So yeah. Um, so yeah, interestingly, but what you said earlier, this, I, I called Andrew and he's like, no, you can't make this, um, but this is something Jose Antonio brought up in his podcast. When you look at the individual plots, you see like squats were all condensed in the in the middle. They all saw similar results. But with hip thrust, you saw a few people way up here and then a few people who lost muscle. With the hip, How do you lose muscle when you're a beginner training for like nine weeks? How do you lose muscle? But a couple of people lost muscle. Interesting. But then you have these high responders. There's a lot more variance, but nothing could be made of that. We needed like more subjects. But yeah. anyway, it was What's just an interesting. On that? Yeah. yeah. And also look, maybe there's really good responders and really bad responders to hip thrust mm -hmm. where squats are more in the middle. Are there people that you've trained that are great responders and poor responders the same exercise? Of course. Like you, like, of, of course. course. Yeah. Of course. It's always I that mean, way. my yeah. favorite part about what you said and what it highlights is and we've talked about this on the show all the time, is just like I think it's important for coaches and trainers to understand studies, to know how to read them, to use that as somewhat of a roadmap for ourselves, but there's still such a large individual variance. There's so many variables with yep. these studies and stuff like that. So to get married to a study and, and then to throw out the things that you see right in front of you, I want to uh, touch on something that I've been hammered online about saying, and I, I heard you say too, in my experience, because <coughs> I've trained a mm -hmm. lot of people that are trying to build their glutes also, I had tremendous success with uh, teaching them the sumo deadlift. 
And I get so much, so much oh, shit yeah. for that yeah. as a uh, as a glute builder. But I'm like, let me tell you, I have trained fucking hundreds of people that had a trouble building their butt. I've taught them how to sumo deadlift, and their butt grew significantly. How would you explain that in, uh, to the average person on wh why why do you think I see that? When you, well, this goes back to the we need to now learn the mechanisms. Like, <clears throat> so the. First of all, it used everyone used to agree that sumo was best, and then Chasm came in, and that's this is when Paul Carter was Team Chasm, and now Paul Carter's Team Chris Beardsley. So when Paul was Team Chasm, they both became <coughs> adamant that like, and they're so vocal, and Paul's so Paul Carter's so um. Is that the guy you got into with? Is he the run, lift, lift? Lift, run, bang. Oh, he's, oh, he's yeah. a super he, secure individual. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we've, we've got a run you want, But he got yeah. like. JPG, that guy on TikTok, he's got like, I haven't yeah. even looked lately, but he had like 4 million back sure, like a year ago. So sure. I don't know what he has now, but J, the JPG guy. Dr. Oz has more followers. Uh, that tells you a little bit about <laughs> well, how much that means. <laughs> but uh, Eugene Tao, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all yeah, these yeah. guys just started parroting them. And that's the, f that's when I kind of realized like, oh my God, like you want to make money position yourself against me and go against all my of course and think about that back then it was like don't do hip thrust do the cas glute bridge that's a hip thrust pulse like it's just <laughs> the lockout of the hip thrust we've been doing that forever why does he get it named after him <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even have hip thrust named after me <laughs> nice I'm like, brand, yeah. but it was like don't do sumo do narrow stance for the stretch so it's that's the argument stretch versus activation which is more important for glutes this plotkin paper showed that they're pro they might be equal we need more studies but yeah. so far what we have to go by is maybe they're equal so we, what would be cool is to have a conventional group and a and a sumo group now there's only one emg study on this is escamila back in like the early 90s i think it was a uh, uh, he showed similar glute activation with sumo and conventional but on the whole, there's probably maybe like eight to 10 papers on this. Probably 80% of them show higher EMG activity when you go wide. Because when you like abduct when you an feet, external you rotate. You gotta push your knees out. You, well, you, put, you better align well, the fibers in my opinion. Some of the fibers are gonna be more in alignment. And it would make sense for, maybe you improve the leverage, the moment arm improves. And then the, that's this theory that Chris has put out. And it's funny because when I was applying for my PhD, I put this in there. It was it's, it's they call it neuromechanical matching. Of the the nervous system senses when you have good leverage of a muscle and it activates it yes. more to a higher degree. Yes. And I thought that made sense way back when I was getting my. But there were only two studies on it back then, and they were conflicting. There was evidence for the delts, but not the glutes. But I said that in my. PhD, my first year PhD thing, and they they liked it, but they said, "Where's your evidence?" And I'm like, "Well, it's just more that it makes sense. Like, there's not a lot of evidence, but why would why wouldn't the brain or the nervous system do that?" And now we have evidence with like the respiratory muscles, and there's some animal research, but that's still a theory that needs to be fleshed out. So in that case, theoretically, you'd get more passive related growth from conventional more active related growth from um the sumo but i'm a big fan of sumo and people love it yeah. on leg press on squats on deadlifts so we need to learn more about that and more, more about the not just the not just training studies but learn more about the mechanisms of, of hypertrophy in general it might differ from muscle to muscle well, because think about like muscles that stretch like pecs it makes sense like yeah you feel your pecs. You feel your hamstrings get stretched a lot. Yeah. But delts. Yeah, stretch the delts or the traps or something like that. Like So, like, but it could still be that, like, delts, like, maybe cables are superior to dumbbells. But my thing with that, just to go on a little side tangent, people always talk about, like, because I do cable mm -hmm. lateral raises. I love delts. If you really want to maximize tension at the bottom, you would have the it be perpendicular yes. at the bottom and you have the right. the handle set at the height of the hand. Yeah. But then when you get to the top, the line would come up through and you'd have like nothing. Mm -hmm. So it'd be everything here and nothing here. Whereas a dumbbell is theoretically nothing here, everything here. All the torque is out here. 
But here's what people don't understand. When you're doing 40 pound lateral raises and it's up here and you're trying to lower it under control, you're fighting it all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That momentum brings you still working the muscle and the stretch on the way down and then reversing it. Not to mention the change of direction. So people don't the realize this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're, right. when you're lowering a 40 pound dumbbell, uh, it might not weigh directly 40 pounds at the bottom because of the, you know, the way gravity works, but because you're, you're changing the momentum, temporarily it actually does weigh quite a bit because you have well, to you're stop working hard. You're, you're working hard in that range still that's right, right. yeah that's right so, this is when this is when science annoys me because people get so myopic on all these yeah. different whatever and I, I, honestly it just it's very very simple okay uh it depends on the person and if you have trouble activating something muscles that squeeze that muscle excuse me exercise that squeeze that muscle are probably going to be better for you or at least be super valuable to you more so than somebody that doesn't have that's trouble. Right. the point i was going to make that you made already with why i would say the sumo and the deadlift is because most people again trying to build their glutes have a hard time feeling their glutes so doing an exercise where it forces them to feel it better which i think well to me why to me why try and stretch your glutes with a deadlift anyway you when you bend your knees you get more yeah deeper so to me you use deadlifts to stretch the hamstrings so I'm team sumo, yeah. but also just train bikini competitors. They love their sumo. Like yeah. they tend to feel, I always say this, people who become experts are the ones who care about it the most. Like women, there's a study showing that they do, you know, like 40 sets of glutes a week, whereas men do nine. Mm. They care about glutes as much as we care about delts, buys, tries, like everything yeah. you know, combined. That's how much they care. They focus, they pay attention. Now this study did show that like you can't just go by sensation. However, I do think there's some merit to like paying attention because I mean, if we went around and pulled all four of us, what are your favorite pec exercise? What are your favorite yeah. bicep exercise? Yeah, we'd all have different, feel. Yeah. we'd have different answers. Look, you can't. Why are you, you gonna do one you don't feel that here's much? Here's the bottom line too: yeah. is that uh, you we we like to separate, or should I say, the science uh, and evidence based community likes to separate the subjective from the objective. But workouts are both, period, end of story. So a simple example is, hey, what's your what's the best, most effective form of cardio? What A good trainer is always going to be like, well, which one do you like the most? Because that's the one you're going to do. Yeah. Uh, yep. Other ones you're not going to do, and they're not going to be effective regardless of what the data says. Another example, it, there was a study that we saw a while ago um, where they compared, I think it was a leg press uh, machine to a barbell squat. And it was a short study. It was like eight weeks long. They took beginners. And they found that the strength and muscle gains of the leg press were slightly better than the barbell squat. Now, most people, I saw lots of people posting this and saying, oh, look, machines, way more effective than free weights and blah, blah, blah. I said, look, if I take 100 beginners off the street, it, they're going to learn how to do a leg press very quickly. And very quickly, they're going to be able to apply a lot of force. It's going to take me at least five to six weeks to get them to be able to squat properly. I'm not going to start reaping the real benefits of the squat until they have the biomechanics and the technique and it's the tension. Funny, that argument was used. There's this guy, Chester Soko something. It's this, this guy, freaking worst scientist, but he uses it to like, he's, he's, he's so biased against long lanes, but that he just ripped our study apart and said, I, he thinks that like, he's one of these conspiracy guys that thinks everything's just, well, Brett funded the study and <laughs> Brett, like I had nothing to do. You can if you call funded the study, like, the bar, the squat, the, the hip thrust would have crushed the squat. What an no idiot kidding, you are. Right. That's, if you're well, terrible he at this. <laughs> it did, but he like doctored it. But yeah. anyway, he, he he thinks that I that it was just me planning the methods and I'm like how can I come up with a way to give this <laughs> the the hip thrust the advantage and so I chose just the perfect time period like <laughs> nine weeks where the squat that's where you start finally mastering the coordination and then squat gains would have taken off mm. but I kept it at the right time point to give the hip thrust the advantage I think it's the other way I think squats had the advantage with this study because um. Probably what what if you guys were trying to grow your glutes, how many times would you and you just had the squat, you'd probably squat twice a week. Yeah. It's yeah. fucking hard to yeah, keep three using, is too using much taxing, or you'd have to yeah. significantly reduce the reduce intensity. Effort, yeah. yeah. So for progressive overload, two times a week is great. Pretty that's yeah, great. for squat. But for hip thrust, if that's all you were doing, yeah, three, four days a week. Three or four. four yeah, yeah. Three or four, right. Yeah. And so I think for that reason hip thrusts don't beat you up as much. You could hip thrust more frequently. And so in, in yes. research, you've got to, to get it published, you've got to equate volume.
But in the real world, you don't have to equate volume. You can write whatever program you want. That's that's but why we, that's why those studies that show that uh, frequency doesn't matter as much if you equate for volume. But the reality is, you take the average person, you have them divide up the volume they would do in one day over four or five days or three days over time. They're going to do more volume because they're going to be able to they're going to be working out more consistently. They're going to miss more, more work volume out and, while fresh, more quality volume and also right. quality volume. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that too. It's funny because. Like with that research, I'm like, that that can't be right. Like you can't, and I hate when people, because like I said, I'm in the gym working with people. There's no, can I say the F word? You oh, can. Yeah. There's yeah, no yeah. fucking way that training the glutes one day a week, equating volume. So these girls, every bikini, that's what, you got to look at the pros. So I, I loved full body training back in the day, but I remember one guy's like, so you think all the bodybuilders are doing it wrong? And I'm like, okay, I've always been a scientist. No, yeah. they're not doing it wrong. <laughs> They're clearly training the best way for their results for their, like, like you're not going to maximize growth of all the upper body muscles training full body. I like full body because I train, I'm a personal trainer. I get people two or three days a week. And for most people, know, it's the best. It's the best. And right. Yeah. But not for these bodybuilders who need to it could be maxim- in the gym too for two hours a day. Yeah, if they exactly. Need to <laughs> so I always temper things like what I know in this research, what I know as a personal trainer with what the best of the best are doing. And if you look at all the girls, the the influencers and the bikini competitors with the nicest glutes, they're generally training glutes three times a week. They're doing about 36 to 48 sets a week. And you go, oh my God, that's so much more volume that's recommended, but they're doing abduction. They're doing different movement patterns. They're doing abduction from flex positions, abduction straight up. Those work different. Those target different areas. They're doing some some hardcore, like, you know, that stretch the muscle a lot, vertical hip extension exercise. They're doing horizontal. Those don't tax you as much. It makes sense when you do it, but there's no way you could say, do thir- do 36 sets in one day versus three days. You, no. They, it, no, and they're not doing yeah. 36 sets, sets of heavy deadlifts and squats. Yeah. No, they're no. doing 12 or so, like th- three sets, three to four sets, three times a week. Like, yeah, exactly. Absolutely, 100%. You can't just do all your volume from that. So no. when you said... You should do both. That's what any logical person who read the study should conclude. You should probably do both, but mm-hmm. that's not what happened. The I was very disappointed because I'm the only person who said I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. All the people who ever posted the Barbalo study, oh, uh, I hate to say I was right. None of I only know of Lane Norton who who said, "Guys, I was wrong about this." Lane's another guy. He's got a lot of integrity with that stuff. Yeah, L- yeah. Lane. I know I was arguing with someone about Lane, and because Lane has a lot of. You either love him or you hate him, you know? Yeah. He's like, why do you like him so much? I'm like, because I could offer him a billion dollars to fudge something or go against science. He wouldn't take it. He wants tons of integrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. he can be an asshole for sure, but uh, I I respect his integrity. And and, and let's be honest, in the fitness space, how rare is integrity? It's the most rare. So rare. Most people are totally full of crap and fake, and you know it right away. Yeah, that's this is the this is the part again that uh, annoys me uh, with studies is they don't take into account multiple individuals, they don't take into account different populations, they don't take into account length of time of the study, like uh, eight to twelve. It's the hypertrophy range. Well, yeah, if you only train for ten weeks, but train someone for two three years, and you'll find they got to train low reps, they got to train high reps, they got to train moderate reps. And then, at some it point, depends on the exercise too. Like, also, the exercise. Try and do standing cable hip abduction in the six rep range. It's, it doesn't make any <laughs> it sense. You, yeah. you got to do higher reps with that. You know, doesn't make any Even sense. Lateral raises, like it beats you up yeah. doing. But I've always said this, and I, I learned, learned this early on. If I got a client that had trouble feeling their glutes. <laughs> Uh, when doing traditional glute exercises like barbell squats and leg press and leg, you know, and, and lunges, I knew that I could get them to feel them with the hip thrust. And I knew I could get them to activate them with the hip thrust. And I knew if I got them to have a little hypertrophy in the glutes and they knew how it felt to activate the glutes, I could then move them or add barbell squats. And then all of a sudden the barbell squat became for them a glute exercise. Yeah. And that's super important. That's something that people don't, you know, ever really consider when it comes to this kind there of There was stuff. a study supporting that, like that whole theory of when you activate and grow a muscle, then you start incorp- you start using it more. It, it always made sense, but I think there's a study now showing that if I recall correctly. But yeah, it's because I we can probably fill our glutes with anything. Like some yeah. people can't. They're mm-hmm. they're so oh, they're yeah. like I don't feel my glutes with that. And I'm like, how do you not feel your glutes? I can feel it <laughs> yeah. 
on any movement now. Do you know where I learned that the first time was uh, I, I did no Mike Menser. Yeah. And his, he wrote a book called heavy duty years ago. And I remember as a kid, I got it and he advocated for what they call pre-exhaust superset. So like isolation before compound, his theory was probably not right, but there was something, there was some stuff that was right to it. He just explained it wrong. But one of the, one of the compounds or one of the, the supersets was dumbbell pullover to pull-ups. Yep. And it was the first time as a kid I ever got a pump on my lats. Now, after I was able to get a pump on my lats, from then on, I could feel my lats when I did pull-ups, whereas before it was all arms as a kid. And that's when I pieced it together and said, I got to learn how to feel something, maybe with an exercise that's not necessarily as good, but once I could feel it, now I can do the exercise and I can make myself feel it. And that for me was a game changer. It's funny. I remember being 15 and like looking in the mirror at my skinny little body and trying to flex different muscles. And I'm like, how do you flex your lats? Yeah. I remember going, <laughs> and like my delt, how do I flex my delts? Well, I can flex them this way, but like, and I would just pose in the mirror, like flexing, practicing. And then I'd be like doing an exercise and I'd be like, I feel it more because I'm posing and flexing. Mm -hmm. And same thing though. Then, then you learn, okay, this is the right feel. This is how you do it. You want to say, have that same feel. Yes. And then every once in a while you're like, I remember staying at a hotel and I, you know, I was going to dinner with a girlfriend, like probably, this was probably 12 years ago or something, but the hotel had a universal gym. <laughs> you remember those old school oh, yeah. universals? And I went in, I just, I had like 20 minutes to kill before I had a shower. And I just did like four sets of like whatever on the universal. Mm -hmm. But I remember like, I didn't go for, I'm not trying to beat any records. You're just going for feel and I got the greatest pump of my life, but I'm like, that was, I feel like that was the first time I really used my lats during a, a pull down, like just isolated or like not isolated, but like targeted them, yeah. you know, and you, you learn that that's why it's important to just, I always say your knowledge is a pie chart, uh, in broken down into equal thirds, what, you know, as a coach, as a trainer, as a content person, it's like one third you learn from, you learn so much from training yourself, but you got to work out and experiment, you know? And then, then the other third is through training other people. Cause we're all so different. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've just started training a girl who's six one, but her legs are longer than mine. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. It's so fun for me. And then the other third is through reading and listening to podcasts and um, going to seminars and reading research and all the stuff you learn through, you know, Re, like re, reading studies and talking to other people and networking and all this stuff you learn on social media and stuff. Well, now, now, now I'm probably more of it's bad than good. But. I like that though. That really highlights. I mean, we talk to a lot of coaches and trainers. We have a lot of coaches and trainers that listen to this podcast. And I think that is a, a, an important That's three. That's the trifecta right yeah, there. Yeah. That you've got all that. Like you can understand, you can read studies. You've got some education experience certifications around there. You train yourself. You've done it enough to where you fit or you've been very, very fit. So you know how to do that. And then you have enough application where you've gone and taken all those things combined that you've tested on yourself, that you've read and studied about. And then you've gone and applied and more than likely saw a lot of things like, oh shit, that that surprised me or I didn't think that was I, correct. That's I, so important. I got proven wrong with clients so many times. It taught me so much because I had an idea and then I got that one person that didn't work. And I was like, mm -hmm. how do you, because you're such a student of of this kind of stuff. And I can relate to that because I just have, I'm so passionate about learning um, all of it. I also like to learn about historical strength training wisdom because so, I think, do you, okay, so I was going to ask you, do you like to go back and look at like, training methodologies of let's say the bronze era yeah. or the soviet studies when the iron you know, curtain we, was up we used to read we used to learn through books and there are books that we had and then if you were a, coming up as a strength coach in the 90s you had to have read super strength super course. training yeah. you, super you read all mel Siff and 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 mm -hmm. you know virko shansky you had zatsdorsky's books the science and practice of strength training you didn't understand it the first time you read it you understand like one tenth yeah. then the <laughs> second time two tenths. And then if you read it, like the third time you get to like, maybe you understand like 30, 40, 50% of it. But like, and now I can go back. Cause Mel Siff was my hero. Um, just such a, he died too early. He died in his fifties from a heart attack, but he was just a legend that critical thinking. But not only those you read like Mike Menser's heavy duty, but related to those were Braun and, and yes. uh, beyond Braun. And for the Braun. That was the Stuart McRobert, whatever the high, the hit training one yeah. set to failure. I think that 
Okay, here's Arthur this Jones. weird dichotomy. Arthur Jones, but this weird dichotomy because I saw the best results of my life when I started doing one set to failure. Yeah. But, but for a short period that of time. was at age 24. So I started lifting when I was like 15, 16. So for basically eight years, I did high volume and people would puke when they do my leg workout because it was like four sets of squats, uh, stiff leg deadlifts, leg press, lunges, oh. leg extensions, yeah. leg curls, hip abduction, and hip yeah. adduction. Yeah, they throw up and I'd be like, they can't do my, I yeah. should have given them way less. Why was I trying to hurt people? Like, so we all did that. Yeah. <laughs> stupid. But anyway, um, when I'd learn a new exercise, I'd incorporate it, but nothing went out. I just kept <laughs> just adding. Added. Yeah. <laughs> and so then I started doing, I'm like one set. How would you see results with one set? But it intrigued me. They had a following. They mentioned Dorian Yates. They mentioned, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try two sets. I'm going to do two sets. Now, instead of four sets, I'll do two sets. And I saw some results. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going on for eight months. I gained so much strength. You I feel the, like then I really learned how to push myself with one set. Remember the breathing sets? Yes. The breathing squats. Oh, oh my God. I did we program that one. Yeah, we, did. Yeah, we put that we, in one of our programs. Yeah, 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 I yeah. did. Uh, I did. Okay. So my friend Larry and I, back in the day, I was like 24, 26, maybe it was my first garage gym. And I, I bought a carport tent and I didn't have enough space. So I put it at my mom's house, but my Larry and I would meet at my mom's house. And I had a carport tent with a power rack Interesting. I made this wooden thing. Basically, have you seen my T bell? Mm -hmm. um, it's a loading pin with a like a C to row handle, basically, okay. kind of like. Okay. And um, but back then I made this wooden blocks with space in the middle, and you'd stand on it. And I bought a loading pin from Iron Mine, a C to row handle, and a carabiner, and you'd load plates up. But it was basically like doing trap bar deadlifts, but with the inside the legs. Oh, it's okay. so comfortable. And now I do those, I have my BC blocks and I have the T-Bell oh, and cool. I was doing those 23 years ago. And basically I only had a few things though. I had the power rack. I had one pair of dumbbells, 25 pound dumbbells. I still have them at Glute Lab San Diego. And, um, but we started doing lunges with him, me and Larry and Larry got 50 lunges. And then the next week, you know, I tried, you know, I, I matched him. Then the next week he got 70. Then I got 70. Then the ne next week we got like 90. We start doing where we try to do 50 steps in a row. So 25 with each leg without stopping. Then you'd be like, <laughs> then you'd keep going. So it got to a point after like, I don't know, say six or eight weeks where he got 200 steps, but I got 170, but I have longer strides than him. So I beat him in distance, but we had a truce. It was an 11 minute set. Oh my you have God. 11 minutes of holding 25 pound dumbbells, oh your gosh. forearms, your traps. <laughs> oh my God. But that was the only time where I've ever then returned to heavy weight. And I went up on my like 185 pound lunges from doing these 25 pound lunges because we pushed it so yeah, hard. Yeah. Usually there's such a specificity to, yeah. to, to weight training. Yeah, but, but that, that much of a great game. Yeah. It, it was 11 minutes and I'll never do it again. Just like I... <laughs> I've deadlifted 405 for 20. I'll never do that again. Uh -huh. It's good to tip. But if you've done those breathing squats, I think I did 225 for 30. Ugh. And But it was like nine minutes. Oh, it was God. like you do like eight and then. Oh, it's terrible. Two more. And then it's just this. So, so I saw amazing results from it. But I think that mindset screwed me because the, the logic was with Arthur Jones and yeah. Stuart Roberts, Mike Mensah was. The only thing that causes gains, like you have to do a little more than you've ever done before. If you just do the same thing, then nothing will happen. And you that yeah. that further, they call it like inroads into your recovery. Like you have to do more than you've ever done before. But that mindset's always. I'm all about PRs. That's mm -hmm. I've always been about PRs and progressive over. But that that one set to failure, and that's the only thing that matters. Anything else than that, you shouldn't have enough in you to do a second set. And now with like Brad Schoenfeld and it's, Krieger, it, it's like their far. research showing, it's too far. It's the too far. Volume matters. Yeah. We, volume we, matters, but people take the volume stuff too far. And you know this if you train a lot of com yes. bikini competitors and probably male, a lot of males do it too. They just get volume yeah. overload where it's like, you know, they're doing so much, but it's not quality suffers. No, 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 no. It's range of motion matters. Connection matters. Volume matters. Intensity matters. Recovery matters. Recovery matters. And then you create a program and a formula and you figure out how to work it and then move out of things. Because the body tends to stop re re responding to the same kind of yeah. 
stimulus application. Yeah, uh, we wrote a program called MAPS Anabolic Advance where we incorporated failure training. But the way that I did it, and this is pretty cool, it works really well, is you have a week of low volume failure training and a week of high volume sub uh, failure training. Yeah. And that alternating tempo, and there's much more to it, seems to stretch out those gains that you get yeah, from yeah, failure. Because yeah. failure training, you get gains quick, quick, but they stop fast yep. uh, for yep. most people. I wanted to ask you what you thought about because this is something that I think is hugely missed in our By space. By the way, real quick. Yes. Sorry, I want you to ask this question. Yes. But um, the way I train people, um, I was training my client Allegra during COVID quarantine times. and You were breaking the law? <laughs> that was <laughs> big time. Good. We all got so close during that time. We all will say 2020 was the best year of our lives. I know people were dying. It was horrible. But we got so close because we connected. had nothing else to do. I was just... Let, you know, let people in the back and put the construction paper over the windows. And we had the time of our lives because that's all you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You're getting out of the house. So they'd stay for three hours. They'd come six days a week. And I got them so freaking strong. Mm -hmm. And during that time I was training Allegra and I, all I, I call it the, the Allegra PR plan. It laid the basis for what I did subsequently in San Diego, all my girls started doing that. And then it lays the basis for what I do with my girls now. If I say to you guys with bench press, because we all care about bench, what's the most reps you've ever done with 225, 275, 315? Right. You know it. Mm. So you have like three loads. And what's, what's the most you've done with those loads, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you write it down. And then each day, I want you to try to beat one something. Beat, beat one of those PRs but you can have like five of them. So let's say you're feeling beat up and tired. Well, you haven't hit 185 for a while, which you've done for 20 reps. So you'll get 22, but it's not gonna affect you as much as like, but when you have it, maybe we'll go for a new one rep max. So then my girls, we do this with the big six. That's my strong lifting. Like the, the my six favorite lifts are squats, deadlifts, hip thrust, bench press, chin-ups, and military press. So yeah, they get in, they're always going for PRs. And then, yes, gains come to a, a halt. So then you switch to a new variation. You do pause rep something. You yeah. do front squats. You do sumo deads. You do deficit something that's different. But you're then you're laying a baseline and then trying to beat it. And it still lays the foundation for what I do. It's so funny because it's taken me a few months to get my girls to have buy-in in Fort Lauderdale. But now they're all loving it. And I'm finally, this last week, I had all my girls crush, crushing PRs. And they're like, wow, like I'm starting to see results. People are commenting on my glutes and people are, and I'm getting stronger. And they make that connection to being stronger and and setting PRs and change their physique changing. Which finally people understand, but it's been a while. You've, you've been in the space as long as we have. Uh, hitting PRs and getting stronger, especially for females, wasn't even like connected to getting in better shape. But we knew this as trainers. Like if I could get you to hit PRs and get stronger, the but results are going to come. We always knew like, okay, if you wanted bigger pecs, Yes, hit it from the different angles, but they're not going to grow that much unless, you know, when you see your friend with giant pecs and he can bench press 315 for 12 and you're getting 315 for one, you're like, I, I should probably, and yeah. not, maybe not bench, but if you like dumbbell bench, you like incline, these guys with the best pecs are doing incline with, you know, they can incline 405 and I can incline 285. I probably should work on growing my incline press for bigger pecs. Totally. It wasn't just I need to add more exercises and hit more angles. Totally. All you right. Just, so you actually just touched on something that we talk a lot about. So it'd be fun to talk about with you. Um, I found that over years of training clients uh, that someone who wanted to build their chest, incline press ended up being like one of the best exercises. Now, I attribute that to, I think, most young men that want to build their chest. They're better at flat bench, so they end up just constantly going there. So there's probably this novelty stimulus. I also noticed with beginner clients, one of the hardest things to teach a client is to retract and depress the shoulders while they bench press and not allow them to roll forward and that the arms and shoulders kick in. And that angle on an incline bench kind of naturally sets the mm -hmm. shoulders back in that place. So have you experienced that with incline press with clients that are wanting to build their chest? Well, it's funny because I think I liked incline it just made more sense. Like upper pecs look so cool. I remember seeing Arnold's up mm -hmm. there and like, I'm like, I want Put a that. glass of water on it. Yeah. But like with women training women, you know, they have boobs. So I, it made sense to me to focus more on upper pecs, like yeah. incline press, but also women who have implants. A lot of times I'm like, 
let's try close grip or let's try incline or even close grip incline. If, if you feel the stretch, well, we won't do it, but you might be fine with them. And usually they're like, oh, I didn't feel anything. I, that's fine. So, but I just think, yeah, I love bench press from a strength point, but I think from a pack hypertrophy incline wins. Yeah. That's and you made a to. good comment too about the implants is uh, you want to avoid deep stretched uh, resistance with implants <laughs> because of the way they're positioned and they're under the pack and it can cause problems or encapsulation issues and that kind of stuff. So yep. Now I want to ask you about, so this is something that is totally neglected in our space, but if you look at the research and the data, it shouldn't be neglected. It, this should be a part of everyone's routine. And if they haven't done it, and if they do it, they'll see very quick gains in a very short period of time. Isometric style training. What do you feel? How do you feel about isometric style training uh, as like the Soviets applied it to their athletes and stuff like that? Yeah. So it's like uh, there's overcoming isometrics. There's yielding isometrics. Yes. So like a explain if you if you have a a bench press and you just hover. Yes. That's yielding. But if you're pushing against a an immovable pins, object, yeah, a pins, then it's overcoming. But then there's also flexing and posing. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a study by Brittany Dankel. It was Jeremy Lenicky's group. They did posing. Oh, no, they did. Sorry. They did just flexing the biceps. So this wasn't really isometric. I shouldn't even go there. But they, but basically one group did dumbbells. One group just flexed throughout mm -hmm. the range of motion. They saw equal growth. So it's like Mel Sif in super training called it loadless training. Mm -hmm. That's what I loved about Mel Sif. He didn't hate anything. It was all science to him. Yeah. Stretching, PNF stretching, posing. He talked about how a lot of bodybuilders noticed more density when they ramp up their flexing and so i like doing pause reps i don't do a lot of like isometrics for time and things like that i've went through those phases it's funny there's so much stuff that you know it's like we're four people in this room and there's this big giant bag of tricks and then you know <laughs> of a hundred things and you're going to like 20 of them. You're going to like 20 yeah. of them, but you stick to things. But I, I, I'm fascinated by the science of it all. You got to try. Um, and overcoming. I think, I think in, in, I think what we should be doing based on this long length stuff, like ye yesterday I trained at a, the 24 hour fitness <laughs> and I did the hammer strength and it's like, it's hardest at the top. You can still finish off with a few partial reps at the end mm -hmm. and then an isometric you know, five seconds of pushing as hard as you can. And, but as pure, like programming, actual, just pure straight up isometrics. I don't do that much of it. I do pause reps, but I'm, I I would say, I would think especially, yeah, I would think you could grow a muscle. Would it be better? And then a, a, a lot of times I get annoyed when people point out like all the research on advanced methods is lackluster which I remember looking at all, I did a presentation on this for the ISSN conference probably like six years ago. Drop sets have good research supporting it. But aside from that, forced reps, negatives, yeah. like nothing shows that good results compared to traditional strength mm -hmm. training. So people take that to mean you shouldn't do it. But half the time you're training around injuries you can have a pec strain and do slow eccentrics with 225, do five, five, six second lowering, and you only get four reps, but you're like, oh, and it didn't feel anything on that strain or like maybe yeah. an isometric thing. Maybe some, there's always, if you've got 10 minutes and you need to do a quick arm workout, you do drop sets. You know, and supersets. And nobody ever applies advanced in the studies that I've seen. Yeah. Nobody uses the. But it's like knowing when to use them exactly. Yeah. And like you That's talked why they're about, advanced. you talked about pre exhaustion. Yeah. And then you said the research turned out to be opposite on that. When you did flies and pec deck before you did bench yeah. press, you end up using more triceps and delts and less pec. So then you can use that to your advantage. Sometimes when I have people do forty five degree hypers. I'll have them do a set of leg curls or Nordics beforehand. Get rid of the hamstrings. And then they're like, oh my God, my glutes are burning so bad. Okay. They end up feeling their glutes more when you pre-exhaust the synergist. So yeah. 
It's just no one knows how to apply the things properly. That's but I'm it. curious to hear about how so you do isometrics. So overcoming isometrics, right? This is this is for advanced people because I, I think there's a, there's a not all isometrics are the same. Okay, it would be like saying every exercise is the same. It's all considered isometrics, but hovering or pausing is not or flexing is not the same as pushing against something as hard as you can yeah. that won't move. The overcoming type of isometrics, which would be the most advanced form in the studies show, uh, activate the most muscle fibers. And in a short period of time, so here's the negative. The negative is long-term doesn't, the, the gains drop off very quickly. But in a short period of time, the gains are absolutely insane. And so the way I, and now here's the other part that's a benefit. They don't damage yeah. that much. They don't cause that much damage to the body. So you can add it. And it's not like you're really compromising recovery. You recover really quickly. Yeah. In my experience doing a set, and, and you have to learn how to do these because over this kind of isometric requires you really know how to activate and control um your 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 force. But if you do it at the beginning of a workout with like a set, let's say of overcoming uh, you know, with a squat or a press, and then go do your traditional workout, watch what happens. It's would, pretty would you trippy. Do it in the stretch, the deep stretch. It, so it depends. Uh, if I'm looking just to activate as much as possible, I'll do it in the part that I'm most comfortable. Because mm -hmm. if you go in the stretch position and you overcome, like in the bottom of a squat, some people's technique and form and stability is not so great to where they could just drive as hard as they possibly can at the bottom. You'll see things start to break down. So I'll start, you know, above it, and you still get that 15 degree carryover, which is what the data shows. But it activates muscle fibers like crazy. I think for strength too, like, you know, everyone's stronger at the bottom or the top, you're, especially with like deadlifts, you have a weak point, you either struggle getting off the floor or you struggle with the lockout. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very interested in isometrics from a, a strength uh, standpoint. From isometrics, I think uh, for, for hypertrophy, I'd be, I, I know there are some studies, um, four, there's four studies looking at muscle growth and most of them show greater in the stretch position. Yeah. But I wonder with glutes, that's actually, I just filmed a video. I think it's going to go up today. <laughs> um, it's like 35 minutes. I don't think anyone will even watch the whole thing, but <laughs> it's on this muscle length debate pertaining to glutes. Right. So the first study I'd like to do is just standing glute squeezes versus seated glute squeezes. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, leaning forward and flexing your glutes as hard as you can where you're more in the flex position versus standing up. Because I feel more when I stand up, I feel like I can yeah. squeeze harder. Interestingly, yeah, it, it'd be cool to see which one led to greater I, glute growth. But um, it might depend on the muscle and 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 the individual. And I bet if you took some of your athletes or, or, or and you had them do a super hard set of at the top, glute overcoming isometrics for 10 seconds just hard as they can at the top squeezing and then they go do their sets i bet you would see some so that's some interesting positives. i've thought about that a lot because there are some power lifters there's um my friend steve clava he he he, he was a uh, he invented this deadlift lever thing that sells on rogue it's really nice but um he was a really good natural um bodybuilder and power lifter but he got DQ'd on a squat once because what they would do is they'd squeeze their glutes right before and then drop down in the oh. squat and they can't have movement. Oh, so wow. when he squeezes glutes, he'd go into some posture pelvic tilt. Lane might have done that too back in the day. They they like squeeze their glute and then drop and then down. Drop and down. I wonder if it had any post activation potentiation effect. I'm like sure, really. you squeeze the glutes and then you go down. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah it was interesting because why would you do that if it yeah. didn't give you an advantage? One of the thing I like about you is that, and here's why I think a lot of trainers and coaches miss. Now, obviously, most of what you do is around development hypertrophy. You train a lot of people who are looking a particular way, or you want them to look a particular way. However, you borrow a lot of training from other strength sports, yeah. powerlifting, Olympic lifting, athletic training. And I think people miss out on this. Like bodybuilders only look at stuff pertaining so to bodybuilding. Agree. But they could learn so much from the techniques of powerlifters and Olympic lifters. And like I learned frequency Strong training. Man. Yep. I learned incredible benefits from frequency with Olympic lifter. Olympic yeah. lifters practice yeah. all yeah. the time. I learned about progressive resistance, chains and bands Yeah, from power lifters. Yeah. I think it's stupid that people don't let, and I noticed that you do this. I noticed in fact that you do, you'll teach how to feel the muscle, which is bodybuilding, but then you'll also teach 
how to practice the exercise, which would be powerlifting, practice well, the movement. I'll give you an example. I, I have a hack squat machine and I have three hack squat machines, but anyway, different locations. But my hack squat in San Diego is a little bit less angle, so you can use more weight. For some reason, that thing, it's a Nautilus. And I have a Cybex in Florida that's steeper. When it's less of an angle, you can push. It's almost like the breathing squats where you could, it's like gets aerobic. You can keep going. Mm. One is hard and somehow you end up getting 10 huh. and it annihilates you. Like it's too much. <laughs> Your quads get mm. too sore from it. So if I've done 10 reps with five plates. That's my record. And this set killed me. Now I've also, I take a trap bar. <laughs> I take a hex bar. I put it underneath the seat. And then I stretch a band from that, oh, from right. the peg to the peg. Okay. And I put uh, the strongest band we have. I have to have someone on the other side doing it at the exact same time as me. And then I put a smaller purple band. So I put the thick gray and then the purple. And my record's 10. It's They're both so hard to do. The bands make it easier at the bottom but hard at the top. But it's still, it's really hard to do. But I don't get sore from that. So, okay, if you just did three sets of each, which would grow your quads more, probably the straight weight, but I could do the bands twice a week. That's right. I couldn't do. So that's, right. that's what, it, that's this whole theory of squats versus hip thrust. Yes. I could hip thrust more. So this equating volume thing, the four of us would do whatever it took. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're not. So yes, maybe the long length stuff and the peak torque and the stretch is best is best, but maybe we're, if we just get myopic about that, you're missing out. Like if you could train biceps, are you only going to do preacher curls and dumbbell incline curls? Are you going to throw in concentration? Are you going to throw in the concentration yeah. curl? Are you going to throw in the, the drag curl where you feel it more at the top? I'm going to do both until we learn more. Listen, we're, 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 we're all building a house. We'd be a fool to only use a hammer. Like, yeah. why would you not? Could you build exactly. a house with just a Why would you not use all the tools right. at your disposal? And instead of getting an argument of which tool is better for building this house, it's like all of them have an application. Yeah. And if I have access to all of them, I think I could build the best house. Yes. This, so. this is why I think it's so important to train yourself and train other people because, on paper, for example, a band attached to a bar and then down at an anchor or a band attached to the bar and then up at the top of the squat rack, essentially do the same thing. They make the exercise easier at the bottom, uh -huh. harder at the top. They don't feel the same at all. Same thing with a chain. I could put a chain on a bar and yes, it's the, the resistance gets lower at the bottom, comes up. Use chains. It hammers your body way more than bands. I can do bands very frequently. I put chains on the bar and it beats me up, totally different. So I'm gonna program them totally different. You wouldn't know this if you just looked at them like data You'd have to actually apply it and see for yourself. And then you'd know, and oh, uh, that, bands, I can do that I'm, way more I'm often. I'm 47. Uh, low bar squats give me this, uh, we call it the arm pain of death. Does you ever get the arm pain from low bar squats mm -hmm. in here? Just because you're holding super tight. Yeah, like it's, yeah. It's, 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 and then, then your bench sucks. And it's not a muscle. It's like the bone. But I think it comes from the nerves. It's yeah. like the brachial plexus or something. But anyway, um. So I so I started doing more high bar squats, but even high bar can do it sometimes if I'm like flexing a lot. So I said, you know what? I'm tired of my upper body getting compromised because of squats. I'm gonna just gonna do safety bar squats. When I do safety bar, oh, it pitches me forward. It's I hate it. It's but it's so much quads and I'm so weak at it. But I did six six or eight weeks of safety squat. Went to high bar and set a PR. Yep. I'm still learning at 47. I've been lifting for 31 years. I'm still learning. I, the PRs aren't very often anymore, but I'm still setting PRs. And I look at all the guys I was, you know, blogging with back in the day. Most of those guys, they don't go for PRs anymore. Um, they don't, hmm. you know, they're, they, they peaked. And I'm still trying to, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still learning on myself and, and trying new things. And I so agree with that. Yeah. It's like, how many exercises did I look at? And I thought that that's stupid, but then you get injured one day and then you try it. You like single leg RDLs off the, off the hammer strength, like deadlift, the lever, yeah. the squat lunge. I'm like, whoo, cause I had a hamstring injury on one side, but I could train the other leg. And I'm like, wow, this works good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of movements that you would have never done. And then 
when you're injured, I always say I learned 50% of what I know from injuries. But um, <laughs> this is how I this is how I really val- started learning how to value the the sled. I I used to look at the sled and say, oh, it's for athletes. Yep. For hypertrophy, there's no eccentric, so yep. it's not going to build much muscle. Yep. Uh, Joe DeFranco, big big proponent of the sled. He trains football players, but I also respect the Hallard. He's an amazing trainer. Yep. Same. Justin, huge sled uh, guy. So I started using the sled, and then it, this is where things get really fun is you notice something's strengths and its weaknesses, and then you see it as a puzzle piece of where you could plug it in your programming. What's great about the sled is exactly what I thought the weakness was. No eccentric. What does that yeah. mean? doesn't hammer my body as much. I could yeah. sled drive every single Crank day. Yep. Up, yeah. yep. And I could hammer the volume all day long, and oh my God. And then I got the secondary benefits of stronger feet, which benefited me in things like squats. Yeah. So kettlebells, I would never, I thought it was so stupid. And then, you know, I found, I like kettlebells with a lot of ways. And I like, uh, especially when you get heavier kettlebells, <laughs> yeah. but like sleds for that same reason, they, you, I remember seeing one Carlos Santana back in the day. He's like, cause everyone started making, this was like in the early two thousands when the physical therapy gained momentum and everyone was like, you know, this exercise is dangerous. This, and he's like, look, you you were trainers. I've never had someone not get a good workout. I've never had someone who couldn't push the sled. Yeah. And that's so true. We start to get so critical. And that's back when the movement screens were, you got to be, you know, and he's like, I can give anyone an awesome workout. And sleds are amazing for that. Also backwards sled drags. Oh, amazing. If you have knee problems, yeah, it's wonderful. Use it as a warm up. And your knee pain goes away, and all of a sudden, you know, now you do your next exercise pain free. Yeah, it's such a good tool. I love every tool, and that's what makes me mad. Is that me being a f- aficionado of biomechanics and a student of strength training, and an educator? I want people to learn the benefits of everything. Right. So mm-hmm. I hate these posts. This is worthless. This is literally useless. This yeah. is garbage. Yeah. That's what makes me so mad is this new, it's a social media era where, yeah. why can't you just say, like you you talked about earlier with, with leg press versus squats. It's like, what I love about training free weights, I can, like yesterday, I put it on the, the my workout was like stack times 12, stack times 15. I can put it on the stack of most machines mm-hmm. through barbell training. If you can squat a ton of weight, you can go to most gyms and max out the stack on the yes. leg press, the leg extensions, you know what I mean? And and so you get strong at everything. If you just do leg press, you don't get strong at squats. If you do squats, you get strong at everything. So I always prioritize barbell training, but I love everything. I love every machine. Of course. Every exercise, every method. Every tool has its place and you train enough people and you realize the pitfalls of everything and the benefits of everything. You, too. you mentioned something else earlier because you, you, you make equipment and you talked about how, you know, try and find good equipment for a five foot tall woman. Uh, free weights don't have that problem. Free weights follow the person, uh, whereas with machines, the person has to follow free weights. So I've never had a client that I couldn't use free weights on appropriately. Uh, but I've had lots of clients that couldn't use certain machines because their bodies just didn't fit or move the way the track or the cable or whatever, you know, was in that machine. However, it made it made them move. Whereas free weights mold to the person. It's literally the yeah, most uh, my, you know, versatile piece of equipment. My programs are centered on free weights, but I've always been fascinated. Like it started with Arthur Jones. He yeah. was the first guy, but he was like too, he went too far. He too, was so biased. Well, he invented towards, Nautilus, didn't he? he was, yeah, the Nautilus machines, but he would make those cams and I'm so obsessed with these cams because you can oh my, you can adjust buddy, the tension my buddy has a arturo uh he he works for he, he used to work for gym 80 and there are this big manufacturer in europe and he could like program in whatever he wanted and it would show you the shape of the cam like they could like design so it's like do you want and and i love that old strive now I think Prime has it where you can load it up in different positions. Yes. Yeah, great but if you look at the, um, I'm so obsessed with this stuff. Like you look at the hammer strength squat lunge where you do deadlifts off yeah. of it, but it's called the squat lunge. Mm-hmm. There's two loading positions. The top loading pin, as you come up, moves closer to the fulcrum. So that so the, the resistance moment arms decreases. So that loads up the stretch more. But then the other loading position stays very linear. So if you load up, plates in that bottom position, it's going to be around the same resistance throughout the hole. But if you load up only the top, it's harder at the bottom, easier at the top. So it loads up the stretch position more. Um, 
So the the Rogers pendulum squat has that too, where yeah. you, you you can load up. So y- you could do them twice a week, one where you have a more consistent, one where you load up, or you could use bands and only load up the top. And uh, it would be a cool thing to see if, oh, oh, well, I just geek out on that stuff. But now it's like, they're saying, well, hip thrusts, like a lot of the long length people, like I heard Mike Israel tell us, hip thrusts would be good if you could design a special machine, a way to make it really hard at the bottom. The problem with that is that it pinches you and it's so uncomfortable at the bottom when you have it I heavy think, loading. I think, but- I think that would be fine for people who are really good at hip thrusting, but I think it would be terrible for the people that we talked about earlier who have trouble activating their glutes. You want the activation to be at the top because that's where they can finally squeeze the glutes. I think if you got someone like that and had it made it made it a machine so it was heavy at the bottom and easy at the top, they would have trouble. It wouldn't actually work very well yeah. and they wouldn't feel it very well. They wouldn't feel them as would. No. Because it works even better when you put bands on and stuff. Correct. And you make it even harder at correct. the top. Yeah. But yeah, these machines with the adjustable cams, they're not very popular because the average person is too complicated. The average person goes well, in. Well, the, 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 he made the cams to fit your strength curve. So it's like... Oh, you test yourself and then it goes? No, oh, you no, can't no, do it no. individually. You do it for the masses. Got it. But like people in general, you can take the average of us four and put us through a pec deck range of motion and it's like we're you're stronger here you're weaker here but he noticed that like he even said this back in the 80s or 90s he said some people are so weak in this position that it takes them like three weeks of training just to be able to use good form because they're so strong in here so weak in here mm-hmm. and i i have always had such stronger pecs like i would just do push-ups half range yeah. and dips half range because if i locked out on my dips i could only get 20 but if i stayed in the middle, mid range, I could do 50. Getting a deep stretch only come up to here because my triceps are always so much weaker than my pecs. Looking back, I was doing it the right way, probably. <laughs> then, then full range became everything. Maybe we should have been like, look at all bodybuilders. Yeah. They'll do like, oh, I was watching um, Larry Wheels. He did 405 for 10 incline the other day. And his first seven reps were only to here. And then I think he, he locked out yeah. eight and then like, or like eight, nine, and ten, he might have locked out. But like his first seven, and everyone's like partial rep. You read the comments, yeah. and everyone's bashing him. But all bodybuilders tend to do that because they're trying to target their pecs. Well, I, I was just, you were reminding me of our friend Ben Pikulski, who we've talked about. Him and I have talked obviously about bodybuilding, and he's a very smart dude. And he said in his theory that people that have a lagging body part almost always, if not always, in his, in his experience. Uh, are weak in the in the contracted position of that muscle, so that it's almost like if they have interesting, weak, yeah. And so that he's had that. Uh, he says almost every single time I've ever had a client who can't develop a body part, uh, when we measure and see how weak they are through that full, range, it's almost always they have a really poor connection or strength in that in that contracted position. So I think it's funny. I think what we'll learn in time. Right now, the pendulum swung. To stretch. It's just like EMG got super popular and then it got, yeah, and it probably has some uses. Like, I want to know, I still care about EMG. I still care about a lot of stuff, but like with this length, it's all long length now because I think there's 25 studies currently and probably like 22 of them show an advantage with training in the long muscle length, but it's all on beginners. Almost every study is on beginners. Maybe it changes. I know uh, Paul Carter and Chris Beardsley have that theory that over time, you know, muscles don't continue to grow longitudinally. And we say there's two types of muscle growth. The, the sarcomerogenesis is sausage links. You're adding more sausages to the links. Whereas myofibrillar genesis or so sar- is, is more sardines in a can. <laughs> You're adding sardines. So you, you don't just keep lengthening the muscle over time. You do if you do static stretching, like you yeah. will keep lengthening. But eventually going through that same range of motion doesn't it doesn't stimulate See, you know, muscle length changes, so all the growth would then become... Yeah. But it's too myopic because here's what's missing, okay? Okay, great. We have 20 studies that show that uh, training a muscle and stretch position is superior for hypertrophy. You know what else those studies showed? That mid-range and contracted also causes hypertrophy. Not that they didn't and it did. Exactly. It's that this is a little better, exactly. but these also did. So why are we going to avoid all of those ranges, of, the other ranges of motion to go for just the one? You know what's going to happen is you're not going to get better gains. You're going to take away from the gains that you got from those other ranges of motion. Like, and That's what I think too. Yes. And as a trainer, 
I'm also looking at this. Fine, your goal is just hypertrophy. That's very rare that you're just training someone purely focused on how they look. And I also think it's irresponsible anyway as a trainer to train someone for aesthetics and cost them their function to the point where they spark. Because we've had bodybuilders in here that we filmed yeah, for our, for our programs can't use them. just to demonstrate certain exercises. And they could not do a proper, fully extended shoulder press because they always train in this. So, okay, great. You got nice looking shoulders, but you have terrible function. Now, when you go to the beach and throw a Frisbee or whatever, you hurt yourself. That sounds silly to me. doesn't make any sense. And I don't think you grew more muscle because you avoided that range of motion. I think you just avoided that range of motion. In fact, I think you would grow more if you also put, you know, focus on that's it. what we need to ascertain over time. Cause yeah. I agree with you. And like what we said earlier, if you were training biceps, you got four exercises. Wouldn't one of them be a concentration curl type movement totally. where it's in the squeeze. If you're doing pecs, wouldn't one of them be like contract crossovers yep. or pec deck where you're squeezing. I would, yeah. I wouldn't have them all four or say all six exercises be stretch position. Do you I remember that one. book? From the, it might have been from the 90s. I think it was called it's, Positions of it's Flexion. It's POF. I you have, that? I have both of them. I went back and bought them off Amazon. You're the first person yeah. I brought this up that Steve, remembered that book. And yeah. they talked about that. They said train a muscle and stretch, mid-range and yeah. contracted. It's, and that's uh, just wisdom, old, bodybuilding uh, wisdom. Uh, 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 um, um, Iron Man uh, yes. magazines. Yes. And I, I remember those from way back in the day because when I started doing my, like writing for T Nation, I wrote like advanced glute training methods and stuff, my ebook. I thought I came up with that. And then I went, wait, sometimes you forget. Yeah, you read it somewhere else. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I read this in the 90s yeah. and that positions of flexion. And I went back and bought them off Amazon. I'm, I have yeah. them in my Vegas home. And yeah. um, I, it's cool looking through them and going, they got this right, but they they didn't understand. So Explain I went, it wrong I went sometimes. And, well, and I went and got my PhD them. because I, I, one reason was I was so annoyed I didn't speak the language. I, I pretty much got my PhD because I didn't understand how to say that squats and hip thrusts have differing hip extension torque angle curves. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I was, yeah. So I would describe it. They have different angular kinematics. I didn't know how to say that. Now I speak the lingo. And then and then you, I went through my probably like five years where I was trying to impress everyone. Yeah, and talk about hip, hip extension torque angle curves. And then you realize you're not reaching as many people. <laughs> so now I don't say that anymore. I yeah. just say this one's harder at the top in the squeeze position. This one's harder at the bottom in the stretch position. Yeah. And then people understand you. Do you have any favorite? So uh, we all joke around because I think that machines, some some have gotten better, but I think a lot of them got worse. I agree. For the, for the, okay. In fact, yesterday being at the 24 hour fitness, the body master stuff was Sucks. great. No, oh, I, oh, uh, the some body of it, the yes. body master. So it's great. Yeah. And they have these yeah, different the knobs stuff. and stuff yeah. and, uh, and some of the equipment that I'm like, I think they're worse now. Yeah, no. So I, so we talk about this all the time in the name of safety and making it easier. Yes. Machine. Cause you know, machines I used to love, I loved now they use cables or whatever, like a nylon. I don't know what it's called. Like a strap like or a whatever. Seatbelt, I think. But, the best machines I ever used used the chain. They used the Those chain. Nautilus ones. And yes, stuff dude. The, yeah. They were the best. Yeah. They feel so good, but they were dangerous because someone put you put a finger in there, you're going to lose a finger. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a machine that we all joke around is if we see it, we're going to use it. And it's the old school Nautilus pullover. Pullover. Machine. Are you, uh, so yeah, you they feel have it at the, that 24 hour fitness. Uh, yes, you're yes, a yes. Yeah. Either Monterey or Park Parkmore. Park <laughs> Park it, more. Yeah, you're at the Parkmore. They have yeah. an old yeah, yeah. weight training. You should go there just for that. They have really? all the yeah, great yeah. bodybuilding stuff in there. Yeah. yeah, that Nautilus, it's so good. No, they have that if that room. I've been there a long time, but they have that one dedicated room. That's great. It's got yeah. all old school yep. stuff in there for yep. sure. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's one of the better ones. So uh, I, I'm such a fan of ev everything, the machines, the equipment, the the history of training, how the old time strongman, the circus feats, how, you know, the hip thrust. Oh, I know that. That the was a, they used the to do uh, the, the bench press. Yeah. They no, with bench press well, they yeah, would people lined oh, up on the bench. Oh, oh no, hip no, so, this is how they get the bar to bench. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, with yeah. hip thrust, they did a pullover and press because you didn't have benches. No, and it wasn't a pullover like the exercise. You just have to get it over Clear your, your head. face. So you'd have to kind of like go like that and then press it up. And then mm. people started realizing that if they bridged up, they were strong. It was called the bridge press. Yeah. 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 So that was the bridge press. And then people started realizing they could help themselves up. So they catapulted up. It was kind of like a, a, yeah. a hip thrust, like a barbell glute bridge, but they'd catapulted up and then catch it at lockout. And then this guy 
came along with crazy flexibility and just bridged it all the way up and arch, 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 locked it out and then came back yeah. down. And then they're going, okay, he didn't even use his pressing muscles to get it to that position, so they outlawed it. But you could say that's the first loaded, but it was for pressing. They uh, didn't do funny. it for the glutes. Mm -hmm. So They also did something called, it. I think they call it hip lift, where this is the most weight ever lifted, or this was the you'd be in a bridge and you'd have like a like a it'd horse, be on like your knees and or something. Well, no, like, they would be on their hands their and their hands, feet, yeah. And they would like, like they lift the piano horse, and like a horse, and yeah, stuff. yeah, 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 yeah. like stuff like that. Them, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, this is all, I mean, lost wisdom. I think there's so much value in in training, you know, but it's not popular because it's hard. But it, it, I'm, I'm, I love, you know, thinking about man. Someone thought that up way back then, or someone thought this up. And uh, and in studying the the trends and th the history of everything, I I'm so fascinated. We just by wrote a whole even, program. Even, I would love whole old timey strength. I would love it's to send all, it like, to you. The bent press and like yeah. we, we brought out back all these old movements. Some of the so, stuff like the the we read sacks and like all these. Yes, I made a blog mm -hmm. post. All the lists named after people. Like but George Hackenschmidt. Yeah, Schmitt, all, a lot of them are old. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll send oh, you. Hack squats are freaking hard. Like yeah. barbell Real hack ones? Squats, we have, we have them in there. No, yeah. no, I'm going to send you this program because you would love yeah, it. Yeah, you would appreciate we it. Went, like we bought a bunch it. of books, and I'm a historian with this kind of stuff, and we literally I programmed. This, I think it's Serious Strength by Alan Calvert. That was written in the 1920s. Yeah. I have a PDF of it. I'll send it yeah, to no, you. No, no, no. I think we have that book. I think that's one of the books that we have. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And then there was one by Eugene Sandow. It's so funny. You're reading it, and he writes about taking cold showers and he says it invigorates the nervous system yeah. how the hell did they even know like mm -hmm. now we have studies that show yeah this kind of stuff but it's uh it's totally fascinating to me i, I wanted to ask you about this because there was a recent study that talked about muscle fiber hyperplasia and this is something that we've speculated on a long time and it's not necessarily what we think did you did you see the study are you familiar was it recent yeah and it showed that muscle fibers don't split and become new muscle fibers but they fuse Okay, so this that research dates. I think Jose Antonio. Yes, um, in the nineties, he looked at like birds and you know, like like loaded the the loaded wing, stretching yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. showed hyperplasia in animals, and it's always been talked about. And if you talk to him, he'll say, you know, no one's going to do this research because it's so painstakingly slow to count fibers, fiber. and it's hard <laughs> to do too. So. Um, so it's always been talked about, same with the whole sarcomeres in series about growing. It's, um, that's a, that's been, there's, there's people that don't think that happens. They think it's just a, a um, but anyway, with hyperplasia, it's probably overstated. Like we don't grow a ton more muscle fibers. You just grow the ones you have more. Mm. But I think the problem is, I think. I think Andy Galpin's no, he showed that you could change the the type one to type two and yeah. vice versa. But like, I don't think you grow a ton through gaining more, more. Uh, you know. Well, more. let me ask you this because I, I, you're great to ask. You've been working out for a long time. We all notice this. I, I think hyperplasia or something like it occurs. It just takes a long time, like years and years and years of training. Like, have you noticed today? that it's really easy for you to maintain a certain level of muscularity. Whereas in your twenties, you had to like force feed yourself and train and act yeah. crazy just to get over a certain body weight. Oh my God. In my twenties, I was always like, yeah. you get sick and you'd lose everything. Like yeah. <laughs> why yeah. though? You're in your peak hormonal period. Right. It's, it is interesting. Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> it's almost like there's a, I, I don't want I mean, this is not an accurate term, but it's almost like closer to like a permanence. With yeah. You ever meet an old person, like an old man who used to be a weightlifter, doesn't even work out anymore? Yeah. Still got the forearms, still got the calves. You're like, where'd that come from? So there's something going on there. So it, that, it's funny, laid the basis for my, the way I do Booty by Brett, it's unlike any periodization system I've ever read about. And what I, what I started thinking was, man, if you guys wanted to set a chin-up PR, you could do it. You just start doing chin-ups three times a week first. Yeah. first yeah. fresh mm -hmm. start hammering them fresh first first thing in the workout now but that strategy wouldn't work for deadlifts start doing deadlifts hard as fuck three times a week because <laughs> no. we Your could recover yeah. so i was yeah. like every lift has its own strategy bench press we could probably do it three times a week just don't also do incline and dips and everything else mm -hmm. But it's like every lift had its own strategy if you wanted to maximize your bench your squat your deadlift um your deadlift i would say 
deadlift hard one day a week, then another day do some lighter stiff legs, not not as crazy, but then also do hamstring movements and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's different lists that transfer as well. So what I and and then the research on maintenance was like crazy, like guys doing three sets a week for a muscle group and maintaining their size and strength. That study that came out, how long? It was not that long ago. It was no. just the last year or two that they said one seventh of the volume is required to maintain. I think my. that was an older study. Was it older? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought it was recent. It yeah, was, no, there was one study I that blogged showed. about it way back in the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was like one ninth. Uh, yeah, I, one I ninth. believe it. Yeah. I believe it. That's yeah. me. Oh, I, do, I, I can train I once a week and keep too, everything. I just think that's so that, so fascinating that's, as shit. So that's what I started doing. I was like, look, it makes sense because we read about periodization and it's always like volume and intensity. That's yeah. all anyone talks yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Go. You could have periods of accumulation where you're doing higher volume and lower intensity and then periods of, you know, Higher intensity, lesser volume. Kind of have them like that. When no one talks about, it's just assumed what you'd, no one talks about exercise selection. I've never read about, you know, you have like block training, you have all these different yeah. DUP and all these things. But like, in my opinion, for glutes, I want them being strong squatters, strong hip thrusters, strong deadlifters. But if you've done powerlifting, it's hard to go, like, I feel like. Deadlifters always do all three. There should be times where you focus more on your squat yeah. and not your deadlift. And other times you focus more on your deadlift and not your squat. Because if you try to grow all three lists, but I started doing the strong lifting with just my clients where we compete with six lifts. It's like powerlifting, but with yeah. six exercises. Well, we train for that. And you think training for powerlifting is tough. Try training for six lifts. So what I started realizing is, you know, I'd have a month where the squat was the focus. You're still going to hip thrust, but you don't hip thrust for PRs. It's just, that's on the back burner. You maintain it just fine. And it's easy to maintain, but the focus was on trying to set a squat PR at the end of the month. So I would have, I changed it because people got bored of it. I thought it was so effective though. There was a well-rounded month where you squat Monday, hip thrust Wednesday, deadlift Friday, and then you, you're, st you're doing like four to six exercises for the glutes. Then month two, Let's focus on the squat. And then I have an upper body lift too, like bench or something or military, you know, but then, then, then after that month, your knees going to be beat up. If you're prone to getting FAI, your hips might be beat up a little bit. So then what a great time to focus on the hip thrust. That's not going to beat up your hips and that's knees. Right. So then I'd focus on the hip thrust that next month. Well, you'd, when you, during the squat month, you'd squat hard two days a week. And then another day do a single leg lift, like a lunge or step, because those transfer well. The hip thrust week, you can hip thrust three times a week. Now you're feeling good after the hip thrust month. Let's ha have deadlift month. So you 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 hammer the deadlift, but on the deadlift month, you're you're only deadlifting heavy one day a week. You do 45 degree hypers one day because it's a similar movement pattern, like weighted, and then stiff legs another day. You're still doing squat and hip thrust and abduction movement patterns. They're just on the back burner more. Then after that month, you do deadlifts. Your low back is going to be beat up especially after week four where you really crush it. So that's a good time to do a single leg month and then dumbbells for upper body more. And that's a critical month because what you learn that month is I did all single leg stuff. It's brutal because one set is really two sets. You yeah, do yeah. like one leg and it was only, and then you got to do the other leg. It's yeah. really like such a hard month. And you do the single leg month and you're like, God, you're worried. Like, am I going to go I'm not down gonna, weight? I'm not doing squats. I'm not doing deadlifts. I'm not doing barbell hip thrusts. And you come back and, and you're you come back and you're fine. And it's good mentally for the, the people to lo learn that, that you don't, because we get so obsessed. I have to have this in my program. Think about training in your twenties. You, 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 you'd bench even if you were messed up because yeah. you didn't want to lose your bench gains. Yeah. And then you learn that month. But anyway, it irons out and balances and stuff. And then, then, then you return to the well-rounded month. That was my my kind of five-month rotation for a long that. time. And it was mm -hmm. just, I've never heard anyone talk about periodization that way, about rotating exercises. Yeah, that's our program. Yeah. So that's yeah. how we write, that's yeah, how we write like, workouts, right? Sounds familiar. Yeah, and it's all experience-based. Yeah. I mean, we, we had to figure that out, I think, You figure that way. out over time. Yeah, like, you do. I can get this person to PR on their chin up or whatever. We got to focus on it, especially yeah. at first you start lifting, everything goes up. Mm -hmm. But after a few years, it's like totally. you want to set up here. You got to focus on something, and and but then it's so easy to maintain. Totally, totally. Yep. Well, Brett, uh, you're. I could talk to you forever, especially if we go down the 
the the path of geeking out on some of the stuff you're, you're so passionate about. It. I love it. I love that I finally met someone that knew the book POF. I must have brought that up like three or four times, and nobody knows that book. So, but it's a good time. It's that always was revolutionary, great. in my opinion. Yeah. Like, I agree. Train a muscle in the stretch, the mid range, and this in the contracted position. I agree, and I encourage coaches and trainers. Uh, I think this is I I nothing taught me more than the following: finding old books and manuals because fitness is so fad driven that we forget and it's no longer popular. Like there was a second there. There was a while there. Nobody deadlifted. Nobody had deadlifted in the gym. Now everybody deadlifts because that's the thing. But there was so much time there for that. Well, people forgot the wisdom of this incredible exercise. So reading old books, old magazines, old manuals, different strength sports, like you will revolutionize your physique I mean, and your training. You're, you're studying history. It's like, it's an important, it's important in every Can't field. Can't where we came from, right? <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, Thank anytime. you. That was awesome. I thought we were going to delve into some social media stuff, but. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, drama. Yeah. Another time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another time we get into drama <laughs> stuff. Drama like this. That was good, dude. No, like, like just the trends that it's going. Oh, that's a different, uh, yeah. that's another time. <laughs> <laughs> I get so frustrated with the algorithms these days. Uh, you know, this, the other day, this, this woman, these two sisters made this post and, and, and this comes up every, it was happening 10 years ago with that. Brazilian butt lift, was, which is BBL, but this was before BBLs were a thing. It yeah. was the Brazilian butt lift by Leandro Carvalho. He was a he was a infomercial mm -hmm. in the early two thousands. Yeah. But he would they would say this like basically they'd show the gluteus maximus and it would be like here's the glute max, here's the glute medius, and here's the glute minimus, and it's like that's not the anatomy. <laughs> It'd be like if I was like guys, there's like. You know, and I made up the biceps. Yeah, here's yeah. here's the the, the long head, yeah. long head, and here's the short head, yeah. and like you, you're just making up anatomy. Yeah, yeah. The gluteus maximus goes like this, and the glute medius and minimus are both up here. Yeah. The glute medius and minimus is underneath. How do you get away with that? But anyway, <laughs> no. these girls made a video, and there were yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, this this um this this. These two sisters made a video and it got six six point six million views and now it's probably at ten million, more than anything I've ever done and ever will do, and they're probably don't not scholars, they probably believe it and they're they they, they never, that means you never even learn you know what anatomy the, you, you never know, even took an anatomy physiology class, and that will get more. You never views. Google the picture of the glue. Yeah, but yeah. Here's, yeah. Here, here's the thing though, Brett, and I'm sure you can attest to this. I know we can. You know we've now we've had. We've been doing this for multiple decades, but this is our eighth year of running this Podcasting. business. Yeah. And, you know, we've never gone viral like that. Three million, four million views on something overnight. And yet the business has grown year over year, year over year, yeah. year over year. And these people like this, they may have this moment of time they where they the go, yeah, where yeah. they go famous because they say something outlandish or that goes viral, that's catchy or that's controversial and they get all kinds of attention. Maybe they make a bunch of money for this, but then no one will talk about them. They won't be around in 10 years selling something like I just, I, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. My only annoyance is that like you said, when you're getting slammed for programming sumo deadlifts because a few people decided to say this doesn't work the glutes at all. Yeah. That's what they were saying. Yeah. Sumo only works the adductors. Yeah. And it's like, do a set of sumo, you feel it. <laughs> yeah. And then you're getting bashed. Yeah, and yeah. me as a scientist, I'm going, I could make any, to, okay, what, what annoys me, and you have to be a scientist to understand this. I want my fellow PhDs and researchers on social media. Well, you have to make it worth their time. So like if I made a post saying, here's the correct, the glute max is here, glute medius and minimus are here, here's the exercise to do. If I did a, the correct version, it would probably get a couple hundred thousand views. Or if I corrected them, it would still wouldn't get nearly as much as their fake video. Yeah. So how do you control the truth? How do you teach? Yeah. It didn't used to be that way. And that's what frustrates me is like now PhDs won't want to be on the platform. It's a waste of their time. Yeah. If you reward pseudoscience and you don't give legit scientists an avenue to flourish like we used to, we used to be able to silence those types of people. Yeah. And now well, it's we, we have a strategy and I'll tell you what, and no, with all due respect, Brett, you use the worst forms of social media because with the reason why we chose a podcast is because we could get on here and we can discuss and talk. Yep. And if you listen to us, you know right away, oh, that uh, that information was totally wrong. They totally yeah. broke it. I can't do that on Instagram. It doesn't work on Instagram. And then the second strategy is this. 
Our goal has always been to reach the masses, but really to influence the coaches and trainers because who makes the biggest impact? If you influence the coaches and yep. trainers over the next 5, 10, 15 years, eventually you create the trends. Yep. And that's our goal. Our goal is to reach the coaches and the trainers to get all these people in fitness that like to fight with each other because we're so damn tribal and say, okay, yeah, so yeah let's, let's find what we have in common because what's the real goal here? The real goal is to win this war on poor health. Yeah. And we have the answer. And if we all work together and we unify our message and start fighting each over each other over whether or not a lunge is more functional than a squat yep. or whether or not, whatever, yep. like let's all unify and, you know, distill our message, communicate to the average person, communicate to the coaches and trainers, and we'll win. We'll win this yeah. battle. You do a great job with that, bro. You guys yeah. do a great job too. Yeah. And I just want to say, I appreciate, um, I just love, like, you guys do, the, we do this podcast, and then you guys take this, the studio is amazing, the quality is amazing, it's, um, so these, it, it's, it's worth my time to come out here whenever you guys want, and do a high quality, you got, ask great questions, you take this very seriously, and it's so cool, because I look at, this is intimidating to me, because you say, you pick the worst, where people have told me to do a podcast for years, <laughs> Um, but it, this is, I, I appreciate, look at the lights. Oh my God. Yeah. Everything that w goes into perfecting your craft, you guys have crushed it. So I appreciate it. thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, in every couple of years, we got to do another, oh, we'll do it sooner. Yeah, I didn't realize we let that much time go by. Yeah. So we'll do Maybe it. Maybe we'll do something now. together. Too long. Yeah. 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 We'll appreciate it, man. Sure. Appreciate, appreciate it, man. It, man.